I think it'll be a very worthwhile use of your time. Staff assures me it will. So uh, with that, Jennifer. Okay, and I guess Doug is going to start us off this evening, so giving us some background. So thank you, Doug. They're hazing new staff oh, now. This is how they roll here. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody want to sit next to Jack? What's going on? <laughs> and it reminded me of the movie Braveheart. And there's a line in there, and it's perfect. Who are and you? The line is, oh no, the, the line is, God tells me I'm going to be fine, but the rest of you are screwed. So you know what? <laughs> Everybody decided they'd get away from me, but you're wrong. So. We, we just want to be able to see you. So we want to make sure we have, you know. I go back and forth. I don't want to see Yeah, Jack, when you turn your name tag up, I'm only going to be seeing yours. So. <laughs> All righty, we ready? Well, this is, um, this is my first opportunity to get in front of you all, and I just wanted to, well, I feel like I know you. I mean, I've watched so many MVIC and board meetings online over the last six months that, uh, that I, I feel I know you all. That tells you a lot about my life, I know. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'll leave that to your determination. But it is good, though, yeah. <laughs> it is good, though, to finally be able to put a, put a face and a, and a name with a, with a voice, and, you know, because you know, the static camera, you can't really tell who's speaking exactly, but, and I, I, I chuckled at the board meeting last time, we were, someone had mentioned about uh, that um, Mayor Tisdale had this recognizable voice, I don't know if it was Councilman Nevitt or, or Commissioner Rozier said that, and I kind of chuckled because I can tell you, and I'll do respect to Mayor Tisdale, but Commissioner Hilbert has the most recognizable voice. <laughs> when I saw Jack the first time when I came here, I knew right away who it was, so. <laughs> I guess we know why you're sitting over there alone, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, but anyway, I, I, am, uh, I am pretty delighted to be here, be part of your, your Dr. Cog staff. And speaking of staff, they've, they've been excellent with regards to, uh, you know, accommodating and being helpful for me. Um, uh, I would like to thank you all, too, I mean, because the decisions you guys make every, every day around your horseshoes um, makes this place a better place to live. And, and I can tell you that this place you're probably not told enough, is a model for, uh, for, for, the, for, for the rest of the country. And, I, and I'm not saying that lightly. You know, I, this is my fourth MPO I've worked at now. And, um, and you know, I can tell you without a doubt that, you know, we look to, this, to Dr. Cog for a, for a lot of different, different scenarios and different policy uh, directives that we do. Um, I even joked in my interview, Jennifer will, will, will tell you this, that I, um, um, you know, whenever we had some policy directive, some policy initiative we had to do at my old place at, uh, in Oklahoma City, the first question I had is like, well, what's Dr. Cog doing? They always, they always told me I had Dr. Cog envy, and, and uh, so I'm very happy to be part of that. All right, tonight, um, what we'd like to do before we get into the heavy discussion and debate about the, about the uh, Metro Vision um, criteria is to take a, take a few minutes and just run through some of the handouts and that that we provided to you because there is a lot of them. Um, you should have a meeting outline which we will try to stay stay on tonight. Um, we also have a, well you don't have that one yet, the summary of material that was sent to you last night, uh, yesterday afternoon which was a bunch of handouts with information that was uh, either requested or desired from uh, the meeting last week, and we'll, we're going to run through that here real quick. And you also have uh, the agenda, the agenda from last week as well, that we'll dive into a little, little more later on as, as uh, we talk about the staff recommendations that were left outstanding from the, from the last meeting. So with that all said, uh, what I thought we'd do is start with the materials that were, were, um, were sent to you yesterday, the summary of materials and go through those one by one real quickly just to see if you have any questions about those because I think these are going to be, be critical to our discussion a little later on. Um, the first one, which is uh, the uh, currently adopted Metro Vision Goals and Policies in Attachment A is, um, and I, I would like to point out as the note at the top of the page suggests that this is not all the policy, goals and policies that are in the Metro Vision Plan. Um, they're, they're the goals and policies that staff believed were, are, are somewhat related 
um, to to the tip to to the tip evaluation criteria, ones that we thought that as as we talk about additional uh, goals that we might want to consider um, uh, having points for in the criteria uh, that we might want to look at. So, if there's any questions on that, we'd be happy to address those. Attachment B is something that was requested and it's the progress on quantifiable Metro Vision goals and you can see just by scrolling down through here real quick that that the, the goals that we have recognized here on this sheet they are trending in the right direction some are some have been have been met to some degree although that that could change from from uh, quite frankly year to year uh, in particular the um, you know the rate of fatal crashes and what have you but uh, you can see from those that all those are trending in the right direction. Any comments on that one? Attachment C. There are two. Uh, there's a map of the of the of the urban centers that are identified in Metro Vision. Um, Brad is here, and he's going to he's going to talk a little bit about Metro Vision a little later on. Uh, sorry about urban centers a little later on, and then on the back side of that is the uh, is the list of urban centers throughout the um, throughout the region. Number four, or the attachment number or attachment D, is the 2012-2017 TIP criteria by project type. This is the current criteria that we use. Uh, that we used um, um, for for the the ranking and priority of projects, um, and it's broken up into two sections. The top section represents the 74 percent or the first phase projects, um, and the the lower box represents the uh, the, the metro of oh, the, the metro vision criteria, the 26 percent that's um, that um, it was used in ranking those projects. Any questions on that? Attachment E is the is the Dr. Cog selected projects from the 2012 to 2017 TIP. Um, I was actually quite surprised by the number of projects when I first looked at this. I think there's 80 plus projects. Hey, that Doug, can I stop you for yeah. a second? Jack has a question. Yes, sir. Um, the the table on the um the tip criteria on the point structure. Yes. Is this just a, a representative template? This isn't exactly what's lined up with what's in there. Am I correct? Did you say that again? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand because I'm just noticing some of the point criteria when I look in here. If I get down to Metro Vision criteria and I look at the point calculation, location to urban center, features of urban center, I mean, there are some in here that are not in here. And I'm just curious, is this just a representative sampling yeah. of what's in there? I think that it represents all the criteria that's that was current that was used for the last tip. So this would be oh. what, what you would find in in table F, in appendix F, in the in the tip criteria. There's a little bit more detail in table F. So six points is the maximum for that one, and obviously in table F, you, you know, it's it, that six points for urban center if you're rapid transit station. Then it kind of goes down from there. So six is that that maximum. Right. So. Right, okay, so this is actually not exactly what's in Table F, but it's more. Okay, it's just that some of the criteria is different. That's why I was asking the question. Okay, thank you. Gotcha, thank you, sir. Attachment E uh, is the Dr. Cox selected projects for, for, the, for the current TIP that we're in. Um, uh, you know, again, I was, I was surprised by the number of projects that were there, and I think 24, 25 different entities did receive a project in the last TIP. Um, and I was really surprised by the number of projects that were selected in the, in the second phase. And uh, some of the, you know, the criteria that was used, although that's, a, you know, for the most part, a, you know, a discretionary pot, um, the very small communities, as well as the under equity county uh, classifications that are listed there, it was very telling. I, I thought it was interesting to see that I th um, 42 projects were selected in phase phase two, and 37 of those come from uh, under equity counties. Are there any questions on this? And of course, I should also mention that the, of those 80 plus projects, that does not include any of the set aside pools or what have you. 
um, such as TDM projects and this, the, um, the, sig the traffic signal system projects, which are, which are you know, countless, really. There's, there's you know, 30 to 50 of those in addition. Doug, it looks yes, like you have another, yeah. Should I do this? Yeah. No. <laughs> I like you when you raise your hand. Uh, Doug, uh, is, is it possible to um, share a spreadsheet that uh, has the projects and their scoring against the criteria in the prior attachment so that we could actually see how the scoring stacks up against that? Because the scoring totals more than 100 if you add all of the criteria on the page. And also to, to take a look and to, just to say, how, how is that? kind of stacked against existing projects so we can at least see what existed in the prior cycle. Yeah, that, that's something we should readily have available. We can have that available for the next meeting or we can send it out. But yeah, that's something we can certainly do. Any other questions on, on that one? On yes, test? Suzanne. Yes. Well, actually, I I want to go back to one of the earlier ones about how we're doing, now that I had a moment to digest, on the quantifiable Metro Vision goals. And just... So, Suzanne, which attachment are you on? I think it's C? B. It's uh, B. B? Uh, yeah. Well, so it looks like we're trending the right way on everything. Um, and you just said Dr. Cog's a model and Oklahoma looks to it. But I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> I mean, what grade would we give ourselves? And are there things, when you guys look at it as professional folks, are there things you would tweak? Or do you think, are we hitting the milestones? Are we on track? Um, it looks good, but I was just wondering if you guys had any more to add about, um, I don't know, things you think that might be useful to how we could improve or we're good to go? Or I guess that's, a, I would, curious to know if you guys had done any deeper thinking about that. Well, are, are, there, in, are there any of the goals in particular that you well, I look at some of these and, um, okay, well, let's see. Let's take greenhouse gases. We want to reduce them by 60% by 2035. We've done 4%. Right. Are we on track there? Um, we're going the right direction. That's good. Um, are we going to meet it? Anyhow, I was just wondering which of these we might want to drill down deeper on. Or yeah, I mean, it. I mean, it's a great question, and, and you know, we, we certainly understand that, you know, we're talking about 2035 goals, and yeah. are we trending at the right pace? Well, probably not, right, at this point in time. But I do, do think, in particular, like the greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, I think that a lot of that um, is going to have, have to do with um, fleet turnover and the efficiency of vehicles as well. That's kind of lays out, out of, you know, what we could really handle internally with regards to our policies. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it is important to note that at least we are trending in the right direction. Are we there getting there as quickly as we probably would like to? Maybe not. Um, but hopefully, you know, we're going to have a discussion about Metro Vision. Go Metro right. another well, some Metro of them look plan. really promising, like the housing one um, that were 34%, and I don't know, um, and we wanted to get to 50%. Like that one looks really, I don't know, that's pretty encouraging. I'm just wondering how we are comparing to our peers and how you guys are feeling about it. I'm going to have Jennifer respond to that, and I know Jack wanted to say something, and Elise also, and Sue. Did I miss someone? Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. It's a little bit hard to do a one-for-one -one comparison against other uh, COGS or even MPOs since we're not all the same. Uh, we have different commuting patterns. We have, you know, we happen to be a spoken hub sort of system here in South Florida where I came from. True regional traffic only travels in two directions, north and south, so it's kind of hard to to make that kind of comparison. And as uh, uh, um, Doug has said, these are uh, 2035 goals. They are aspirational. Uh, they are aggressive. When the board adopted these, it was clear that, uh, made clear to the board at that time that these were, were pretty aggressive. And as we've been working on uh, MetroVision 2040 and doing some scenario planning, we see that, you know, <laughs> some really aggressive action would have to be taken to meet some of the goals in Metro Vision. Um, so I don't want to dive too deep into that unless that's really where you want to go because... Um, no, no, not necessarily. I just wanted... I felt pretty good looking at this and I wanted to know if you were going to grade us, how are we doing? Oh, God. <laughs> well, 
I think in most areas we're, we're doing really well. I, I would agree again with Doug that there are places that we could probably do better, and I think that we will. I mean, when you look at, for just um, to take a, a very local example, when you look at the ridership on, uh, on B-Cycle during the winter uh, uh, times and uh, how many people are, are actually leaving their single occupancy vehicle for other modes of transportation. So I think that we are going to see VMT decrease. I think that we are going to see air quality um, uh, numbers improve to the extent they can. The other thing you have to remember is that the population is increasing too. So we have, you know, we have growth going on at the same time we're trying to, to make all these reductions. So there's, there's um, I think we do really well. I, do I think we could do better? Yeah, absolutely, in some areas. Jack. I think we have to be. I think we have to be careful with with some of these numbers and looking at them. And I'm glad there. I mean, there's a positive trending, is what I'm hearing. But on the other hand, if you were to back out one or two urban areas, I think you would find these numbers drastically impacted and changed very quickly. Um, I think Denver made the hugest contribution here, uh, especially with what they did in their downtown urban center. You would not find, I think, these numbers if you back that out you would find significant changes and differences. And so we just have to be able to look at the whole region and understand how we're impacting the region as a whole and why I think that these numbers would be much better if we were reflective of activity centers versus urban centers. And, and I think that we get down that path and begin to do this. I think we can begin to really track and can control some positive change, in my opinion. But you're right, there is a positive trend here. Um, I, I think when you look at the total number, I don't think it's that great, especially if you just back out one or two urban centers and you ask yourself, wow, well, what happened here? We also have an economic condition that may have impacted these at some point, too, during the last uh, four years or six years in reality. Well, four years, four years since the last tip. Thank you. Elise? Well, I'll make a small comment on this. If you, if you look at sort of um, annual progress in meeting these goals and sort of average out how much progress you need to make year by year. Most of these are on track, even though it's incremental change, you're on track. I think the big exception to that is the greenhouse gas emissions where we are not alone, but we are woefully short on meeting that goal. And that stands out in contrast to the rest of the goals where we're kind of marching along just looking at the metrics. But I wanted to, to have a, make a more general comment. I really appreciate the background information that you've provided. I feel, I was having this feeling after the, the last MVEC meeting that we, we haven't had that foundational conversation to set the context and the stage for making changes to these very detailed criteria. And I sort of, this is a start to having that general conversation, but I find myself wanting to to say, wait a minute, let's talk, talk about Metro Vision, what we're trying to accomplish, the relationship to our transportation funding, where we are, and then talk about what changes. And we just sort of ran headfirst into let's talk about changes without assessing first sort of where we were. And so I guess this is sort of a, a plea to staff to make sure, or to see if we can't weave that conversation into this meeting and to the next MVEC and, and Dr. Cobb full board meetings because um, it felt like we were hungry for information. We, we had a perception maybe there was something that needed to be fixed, but we didn't have the data to necessarily fully understand what was going on. And I, I, I was worried about where that conversation was headed. <coughs> Yeah, Jennifer's going to respond to that quickly. We actually have a schedule, too, that we need to hand out uh, to show you kind of where MetroVision and TIP criteria and RTP and all those things are, um, are on the calendar. Um, and I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Elise. And, and in a perfect world, everything would be synced up so that um, the pieces of the puzzle fit together more clearly. Um, but unfortunately, we're under federal requirements to adopt a TIP at a certain time, and that's not, that doesn't quite sync up with putting together the MetroVision 2040 plan, which is why we've been looking back at the MetroVision 2035 plan to look at those goals and look at those um, uh, policies and, and scoring criteria, et cetera, to, to base this conversation on because they're just not synced up as well as we'd all like them to be. But I hear you on the data and information, and um, I'm glad that this is helpful and we'll work on doing better with that going forward. 
And I, I would actually just ask members if there is something that kind of dawns on you that you would like to see or more definition or background, if, if you could just make sure you communicate that to um, Jennifer so she knows kind of what we're, what we're looking for. Because I think as I review some of this material, it kind of sometimes raises more questions. So I think the better communicators we can be with staff, I think, um, you know, the better educated we all will be. So Sue. Uh, and so my comment really, I think, has more to do with 2040, and I don't expect any action tonight out of it. But when we set 2035 goals, w which is what we're looking at here, we didn't know how we were going to measure them to see whether we could were achieving them, could achieve them. We can, and we weren't sure if they were the right goals because we weren't sure if they were achievable. I think as we move to the 2040 plan, we're finished modifying 2035, it's going to be really important that the goals are SMART goals. And that they're a stretch, but they're attainable, we think they're attainable. We've identified how we're going to measure that. And we use those measurements to take a look at how we did on the 2035 goals as kind of like a springboard to move forward in 2040. Probably not for this TIP program, even though I know it's two years, right? Uh, um, so I, you know, I don't know that we're going to be at a point to do that for this, but, but I do think we need to keep that in mind because as we move forward to the next Metro Vision, I think a really critical piece is figuring out how we're going to measure it and being able to measure it. Because we're still a little bit in the dark, which is, I think, is what everybody's talking about. And, and basically, I have a couple of questions. One of them is, in our housing, and you know, you all got to understand, I'm on a learning curve here. Um, in, in the housing, in the urban center housing, where is there a piece on affordable housing? Because what's happening is, if anyone read the Brooklyn Institute report, 60% of our poverty has moved out of the urban areas and into the suburban areas. And once again, we had that conversation last or last week. Was it last week? God, it was it's last so week. long ago. <laughs> last week, where you know our neighborhoods have been built around the car, and we will never have urban centers in the middle of the suburban areas. And we've got to figure out how we're going to address that. And we'll never address our greenhouse gases because our greenhouse gases are coming from those a couple of million people that surround the urban areas. Until we figure out how we're going to get those people in the suburban areas out of their cars. And, you know, we, we, this, is, this is something that I find a hole in the vision altogether. We're addressing the urban areas and we're addressing the rural areas, but our suburban areas are being completely forgotten. Okay, seeing no other comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Doug, why don't you pick up where you left off okay. on? Uh, I think we're we're on attachment F, and uh, this is the tip expenditures by county from 2003 to 15. Um, if there's any comments on this. I will say, though, you know, the, the under equity county, for those of you who, who are unclear exactly of how this, this is calculated, um, but basically all it is, it's, it's, it's the funds that, that a county has within the TIP. We call those the expenditures. Um, if it's less than the percent of contributions calculated by three weighted variables, that being population, uh, gross VMT, and, um, and uh, sales tax revenues, if it's less than that, then, it's, then the county is considered uh, under equity. So it gives you a good breakout of, um, of, of what counties have received over the last several years. Any comments on that one? Yeah, I had a question. Do, um, a, another way of looking at it, one is looking at it by jurisdiction. The other is looking at it by people served. Um, and sort of money per person served or population. I think it would be interesting to look at that so that we can see if we are sending, if we're investing in in um, projects that are serving the greatest number of people, if that makes sense. Right, sure. um, and I don't know what those numbers would show per se, but it would, there are different ways to look at this, um, you know, county by, you know, relative to contributions. Um, whether or not we're, we're sending resources to the areas that are providing the most travel trips, 
you know, they're different. And so I'd be curious to look at it, um, to slice the numbers that way to see how that, what that tells us. Jack. Yep. Yeah, and, and I, I absolutely agree, Elise. The, the thing that we need to look at now, I'm concerned using population, county population as is an issue. The real issue becomes transit and corridor trips. And you start looking at primary corridors that are connecting activity centers, um, urban centers, whatever you want to call them, even suburban centers. Then what happens is those corridors have become critical because it's the trips on those corridors that make the count. And that's where all the economy is flowing. Remember, Bad as most people, a lot of people travel south to get to the economic corridor, the engine where they have employment and jobs and stuff, and vice versa. A lot of people travel north. They're actually crossing in between, and we're never going to get that to change. We can't force employers to move to downtown, and you can't force downtown employers to move south or north, so or east or west. So the point is, I think the real key measurement we need to start looking at in these is this corridor, these trip. Um, categories are going to become critical and I don't know what we're going to get to because we've never really looked at it that way um, but when we keep trying to measure where people end up where they stop or live versus how they're getting there and we need to understand what that means and what that impact is because that affects everything we're trying to accomplish in the end of the day so I agree any other comments okay yeah, keep, keep a hold of these. And I should mention on that last one, there are two tables. One that shows the expenditures um, with, with just Dr. Cog dollars only, and the other one shows Dr. Cog, State, and, and, um, and RTD as well. So just FYI on that. So keep them handy. I'm sure they'll be useful as we uh, go forth with our discussion tonight. And so what I'd like to do now and – Doug, excuse me. Doug, Jack has yep. one more comment to make. Uh, help me a clarification. Under the equity chart, and I don't know, Steve, you may be able to answer it. Under equity, though, we do have, I think, the second phase of our TIP program is um, equity projects, which currently today we have what, what, a, a minimum point criteria, which hopefully sometime we get where we can talk about that, because I think we need to remove that, which addresses your question, why did we have so many projects in our second phase issue? was because this board recognized from an equity standpoint that was not working, minimum point criteria. And so as a result of that, quite frankly, um, the board took it to its own discretion to say, you know what, we're going to start looking at what's the right project for the region and using those funds to address that. So my question is, are, are those equity dollars we're talking about here, this is total tip, right? Not just the 25%. Yeah. Right. Thank oh, you. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Okay. I well, we thought what we'd do next is, um, I know this Dr. Cog tip development is new to a lot of us, so if we, just to make sure we're all on a, um, we're all at a common point of understanding about where we are with Metro Vision, how this fits into the, to the, to the, um, to the point criteria and what have you, we thought we'd, we'd talk about um, a couple things that was, you know, mentioned last time. It was really a point of emphasis last time, one being urban centers. So Brad's going to give um, uh, a quick quick little presentation on that um, but first you know I think I don't know it was Steve or Jennifer last last uh, meeting mentioned um, you know Metro Vision is kind of the nexus for um, um, this a nexus between the board's role as the regional planning commission and as its role as the as the metropolitan planning organization um, and, I, and I, th I think that was that made a lot of sense to me and I, I, I and I, and I hope you know, makes sense to you because I think I don't think there's anybody that would argue that land use policies ha has a pretty profound um, um, effect on transportation on our transportation system. Um, you know, and we know that as as our transportation dollars you know begin to dry up more and more, and certainly you know there's a pretty big discrepancy between what's in our vision part of our long range plan and what what was in our fiscally constrained portion. I mean, but in order to 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 complete that vision vision portion is by we needed about 30 30 40 percent more dollars so and we know uh, federal dollars are certainly becoming harder and harder to achieve and as a result it makes um, land use policy decisions such as Metro Vision even more and more important so I, I think what Metro Vision has done and and again it's the reason why it is the model of uh, for, for other other areas is because it looks at our transportation system more holistically than just looking at throwing money at, at a transportation problem. It actually addresses land use principles as well. Um, and uh, so, 
Well, I, I, I just leave it at that. But I, I really do think what, the, what MetroVision does is it establishes that, that framework for a growth and development that by, and, and thereby uh, minimizing the, uh, the additional transportation infrastructure we might need in the future. Um, Brad, this might be a pretty good segue for you to come up and give a, your comments on the, on the urban centers discussion we had last time. And uh, we'll entertain questions at, the, at that time. So of course, if I would have heard tonight's conversation, maybe I would have had a different talk for you um, this evening, but it is what it is. And I'm also happy that this meeting started at 6.30 rather than 4, because this is one of those days where I don't feel like I got to start working um, until 4 o'clock. So happy to be here a little bit later. Maybe you aren't so much. Um, just very quick, uh, brief history about Urban Center so that people kind of get a sense. What I really wanted for everyone to understand is this is not a new concept. This is not a 2035 concept. The idea of urban centers actually goes back to a regional plan that, that, that um, Dr. Cog adopted back in 1978. The concept of urban centers appears in the original um, Metro Vision vision that was adopted in 1992 and has appeared in every Metro Vision plan that we've done since, since then and actually sort of serves as the framework uh, for the regional um, planning work that we do. Um, urban centers were included um, in Metro Vision 2020, um, the first sort of iteration of MetroVision. And I think the thing that's probably important to realize, and I don't know if everybody rec understands this, Dr. Cog does not go through a process and identifies urban centers. We, we respond to local entities that come to us and say, we have an urban center and we are, we are meeting the criteria that, that the board um, sets for um, urban centers. I will tell you that the first time that we tried to do this late, back in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, the process to recognize um, urban centers was incredibly complicated. Complicated. It took us about three and a half or four years for the first urban center to actually be designated because the sort of the the process was so sort of overwhelming and, and comprehensive. Anybody have want to wager a guess as to where the first designated urban center was in our region? Go ahead, Pat. Hey, you don't get to what? Anybody on the board before? Yeah. All right, let's hear it, Pat. Nobody knows? Glendale's correct. Good job. Um, so since, the, since that very first um, designation, we actually now have 103 urban centers that are designated in the plan. Um, those are the ones that are listed in your packet. Um, it's obviously a lot of centers. Um, I did a quick count sort of sitting there while Doug was talking, and that's 24 um, jurisdictions that are listed um, on the, the handout. Um, that does not include um, downtown Littleton, which is actually sort of in the, in the hopper. Um, Envic actually approved uh, us going forward with analysis on that urban center, and the board would actually go forward with including that or designating that in February. So that would take us um, to 104 urban centers in total. And that 20, so that 24 number doesn't include um, downtown Littleton and does not also include um, Porsche. Like, for instance, if you look at that list, you don't see, for instance, Arapahoe County. Um, they don't have their own urban center in, a, in the unincorporated portion of the county, but there are obviously incorporated areas within the county that do have designated centers. So that, that, that number also does not include, um, include folks like that. Um, it is not also, that number does not also include, if you look at the map or the, um, the list in front of you, the I-25, the southeast corridor, very large urban center which has multiple jurisdictions that are actually associated with it. So we typically just say multiple. So for instance, you don't see Greenwood Village on the list, but they actually are um, covered by a portion of an urban center. Uh, the other thing that I sort of been thinking about this as you guys were um, discussing the previous items that I think it's important to sort of mention is that, um, you know, we talk about the 5075 goal for urban centers a lot, and I think that's an important thing to talk about. What I think oftentimes gets lost in the conversation is the importance of urban centers to our other goals. Urban centers in many ways exist um, because of the relationship of um, concentrating population and employment in transit-enabled places and that relationship to reducing VMT, increasing the number of people that are commuting to work via single occupancy vehicle, um, the, the ability of this region to preserve um, open space. So we think about urban centers sort of in a silo, but really the, why it's so important in the overall plan is how it connects across other issues that this board um, has decided are important. 
Um, so I wanted to, you've got a table in front of you, you've got a map. I just thought I would walk through just some examples so that you can get a sort of feel for the types of places that are currently designated as urban centers. So you've got places like um, uh, the Denver Tech Center or the area around the Bellevue Station, as an, as an example. You've got a um, place like Westminster, the Westminster Activity Center. And for planner geeks like me that love aerial photography, if you, if you were look closely enough, this is when the mall was actually being demolished. So you can see sort of the mall sort of disappearing um, in front of your eyes. Obviously, major redevelopment opportunity um, up in Westminster. You've got places like, again, Glendale the first, um, but also um, the Cherry Creek area. So a lot of these all have, have existed, existed for, some quite time, for quite some time, um, but we also have um, places like downtown Castle Rock that because we have constantly thought about what this designation process looks like, they have become eligible to be designated over the last couple of years and they took advantage of that. Um, we used to have a pretty hard cap um, that said you had to have a certain number of employee, employees per acre or a certain number of residential units or population per acre. That really has gone away in the designation process. It really comes down to sort of the essence of, uh, of urban centers as outlined in MetroVision is are you mixed use, are you multimodal, do you have a variety of housing types, um, are, are you denser, is that area denser than the surrounding area, um, and is it really something that's been locally identified as, as sort of your local priority growth area? That's sort of the essence of what those uh, multiple policies um, uh, talk about. Another one that came in recently that, again, probably would not have been able to come in um, under previous ways that we designated urban centers, um, downtown Louisville, historic sort of downtown setting. Um, and since Mayor Noon mentioned it last time, the South Glen area came in um, recently. So. Um, obviously a major redevelopment activity, but in a, you know, in many ways a, sub a suburban um, setting. So that's really, you know, kind of the gist. I just wanted to give you a flavor. And the other thing that I thought of is, as folks were talking kind of about how we're doing, um, you know, you have and what's in your packet sort of relates to that goal. So, um, you know, we are doing pretty well on the housing side of things in terms of getting that trend toward, closer towards that attracting 50% or capturing 50% of housing in urban centers. Um, I think Commissioner Hilbert is probably correct that there's some recession things going on there in terms of where folks were building and the type of product people were building. Obviously, we've seen a lot of multifamily. So five years from now, you, you look from that and there's a different sort of real estate cycle. It will be interesting to kind of understand kind of where we're trending um, in that direction. But we have done um, some analysis to sort of, again, understand what I mentioned previously is not just how are we hitting the 5075 goal, but are urban centers actually contributing to the VMT reductions or the SOV reductions that ultimately are the other goals that we hope that they ultimately are supporting? And our, our initial analysis is, um, suggests that, that they are, in fact, doing that. We looked at this um, in the, sort of the middle of last summer. Um, we have found that urban centers are supporting a higher number of non-SOV trips but what's interesting, and this is also something that kind of Commissioner Hilbert um, mentioned, not only within the center, so within that geography, within, within this geography here, there are more non-SOV trips happening than the, the larger region, but also center to center trips. They're actually supporting people taking alternative modes, um, both from that center, within that center, but also to other centers, which to me is obviously very promising. Um, and the other thing that we noticed in that analysis is that particularly the higher density urban centers are definitely contributing to lower VMT in the region and, and in their sort of sub area with the sort of key note being that there has to be housing present. Without housing, you, you lose that. I mean, housing is the thing that is ultimately driving shorter trips that people can, can ultimately reduce how many vehicle miles they're traveling and or converting um, to other modes of travel. So to us, it was promising that the relationship and the connections that we think urban centers are having to our larger regional goals tend to be um, borne out by, by analysis by staff. So that was the gist of the refresher. I'm happy to talk more about it. I could do this all night if you'd like. Elise? I was just wondering if this analysis was something that was written up that you could share with us as sure. a report. Yep. I, I'm sure a number of us would love to see. We, just so that we did an initial scan. Um, if you really are curious and don't even want to wait for me, if you go to um, the MetroVision Planning Advisory Committee agenda packet from May of this year, there's a, there's a write-up. 
um, but we're going to have uh, even a more robust write-up that we're going to do over the next probably three to four months that will come obviously back through this group as we're talking about urban center policy issues. Thanks. Rocky, did you have? Yeah, just a couple of things and uh, maybe some things where you, you can add some clarification and a few things that are maybe important. Oh, I'm sorry. So one, again, last time I could tell we were starting to have some conversations about, you know, what's urban, what's suburban, and, you know, how does that factor into all of this? And I guess first an observation and then uh, maybe a question. So we're clearly seeing, even though we're using the term urban center, I think kind of the historic use that you have a city and suburbs, you know, we're saying urban centers uh, are in any kind of a municipality uh, within the urban growth boundary, okay? So, and it, yeah, and I was, uh, I'm seeing the Adams County folks uh, chit-chatting there, so I just counted, so there's 21 urban centers, you know, in, in Adams County and so on. So, you know, we, we may want to have a little bit of a conversation about what that means to have these urban centers in what we understand are, are different geographies and, and places in, in the region. What, what does it mean? So what does it mean for Westminster to have uh, an urban center versus the Denver Tech Center and so on? And I guess that's what gets me into the question is, you know, how much is that addressed right now in, in Metro Vision that even though we're talking about, you know, a regional aspiration that collectively these centers get to a 50, 75, goal, uh, you know, is that an expectation for each and every center to perform the same way, you know, can, can you address what, what's the deal? No, I mean, no, I mean, the, the plan very clearly describes them as unique, like the, it's, the expectation is that they're going to be unique circumstances, but it also, to your point, um, that they will be located throughout, throughout the region. I mean, it's, it describes sort of a network of connected centers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really critical. You know, I, I think, um, the urban word in urban centers is not really fair to what it really is. Um, frankly, Commissioner Hilbert's suggestion of activity center is actually closer mm -hmm. to, to really what is sort of behind, sort of from a, from a planning framework, what's behind these places. And so it's, it gets, it's stuck with the word that maybe isn't the best word at the, at the, at the current time, but we can change that. Well, and I, I'm obviously baiting that for uh, Commissioner Hilbert here a little bit, because uh, uh, that's it. I think if, if the language is causing a problem here, and not meeting our intent. I think, you know, that's an easy thing for us to address here. So, and maybe again, something that we just need a lot more clarification so people feel comfortable with, if they have a, a center activity area, you know, that it is unique. And uh, uh, again, it's, uh, you know, performing in terms of expectations set locally within the regional framework. And I'll just add quickly to that, um, you know, when, when we addressed the, de the designation process in the last couple of years, that was really at the heart of what we were trying to do. We wanted to create a designation and recognition process that ultimately said, here's what MetroVision says is an urban center. Within the local context, just find that place that is ultimately consistent with the tenets of that vision and make the case to Dr. Cog that it's consistent. It's, it's, there's no there's no judgment of scale that it needs to be a certain intensity. It's simply mixed use, multimodal, and a variety of housing options. It's, I mean, it really is as simple as that. Okay. Thanks. Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, just to, uh, Brad, just to go back to uh, your comment about the importance of the residential component within an activity center, because some of these um, I might not see as much residential potential as far as growth. Uh, as others, and so there's a, a different mix, and uh, I'm fortunate in being familiar with almost every one of them that you presented this afternoon. Uh, I will tell you, this, this, is, this is what I would call a planning legacy issue, that we've been designating urban centers since 2000, right? And the previous way that we, the previous things that we emphasized, we, we emphasized jobs over housing. But the policy landscape around urban centers evolved, right, to where now housing is a, is a bigger part of the conversation. So we still have on the books a lot of urban centers that are ultimately employment-driven um, and less housing-driven. Jack, 
you're Brad, yeah, chomping at the bit. They wanted those. That is an excellent yeah. point. And can you do something, if you don't mind? Because this is exactly, feel what I've been wanting to point out is that, and I, I think you, you were very eloquent in what you just said. It's a legacy issue based upon our planning process. Because when you go back how many years this started, and as we've developed and grown as a community throughout this whole region, we've had significant growth. We really have. But guess what? We haven't kept up, up with what we are defining as an urban center in that regard. Because if you look at this urban center, very little housing there, but if you go back to those others that he was recognizing. But, but I'll, I'll add, but if you think about it, before this, there was no housing. Right. So, so, it, so it, it is in itself and it's evolving and it's recognizing the importance but of it. But if you go back to some, there is no housing opportunity. So the question becomes, should we, and if you look around them right there, look at that one. I want you to stop and look at that one for a minute. That's a perfect example. Look what's below it. Look what's above it. Look what's to the right of it. That's pretty dense housing, if you really think about it, from a standpoint of a suburban community. Most people think of suburban communities of, of, of one house every half acre or one house every quarter acre. No, I mean, this, this looks like it's six to seven DUs per acre here. So we have to start thinking in those terms that this becomes an activity center, and as you have that dense population of, of six to seven DUs going out to four to, to two and then out to one do you, you that's how your growth should be accomplished and that's how your center should spread out and then you have the connectors in between them and that's good growth management because you want your higher population near your center so that you have walkable bikeable and you've got a, a, a possibility for people to get to where the grocery the shopping and everything is and work in those areas so that's just a great a great option or opportunity for us to begin to say Maybe we need to redefine this and say that line could be moved very easily and say, now how do we manage that in that regard? And I don't know, or we just change the designation to activity and redefine it, but it's really a cool example. That exact picture is a cool example of what's been happening. And is, is Westminster here? Is it, is it okay if I pick on them then? Is that, I mean, I don't really, I don't consider it picking on them. Absolutely. But, um, this is, a, this, is, this is a perfect example of sort of the legacy issue that I discussed. Um, so previously under a previous version of the designation criteria, something this board has actually walked away from, you had to have a minimum employment density for this entire area in the future, and you also had, had to have a minimum residential density, but the minimum, minimum residential density was actually pretty low. So you have lots of urban centers that are largely commercial, and then they grab just a little bit of residential off to the side just to sort of hit that figure was sort of a gamesmanship sort of thing to sort of figure out how do we draw a boundary that actually meets these criteria that have, that have been set. So, you know, again, I feel like we've walked away from that. It really is now about, you know what MetroVision says, tell us if this can meet it. And we've actually had, you know, many communities over the last two years that have actually come in and revised their boundaries to, to update their thinking and their approach about these areas to bring in some of those um, larger, larger residential areas. I will tell you one of my things in terms of the overall meeting the 50% the goal for housing, it's areas like this that really worry me a little bit because there's so many places that um, how, how, how competitive is housing in the land market to actually fall within this boundary? I think there's plenty of market maybe just outside, but the, just where the, the cost of land is really going to tend to drive it more towards um, commercial uses without an intentional effort to try to add housing into this area. Eva. And, and to add to that, also a lot of people when the urban centers are built can't afford to live in the urban centers. So once again, we're pushing the poor out of the urban centers. The people that can't afford the transportation aren't in walking distance of that transportation. And to correct you, we have 12, not 21. This is not in Adams County. This is in Jefferson County. And you're probably also counting a lot of Aurora. I, I just, we'll, we'll take what we can from Aurora. So, but yes. But yeah, that, so the, I mean, we, we really have to start looking at alternative ways of addressing the suburban areas. Because we can have neighborhoods like that, that are two, three, four miles long, with no opportunity at all to be able to get anything like that into those neighborhoods. And we really got to start thinking outside the box to figure out how to get those people out of their cars and into, transpor into alternative transportation. Rocky. Just quick, I think one of the things to add to the conversation here with us is, you know, we're talking about the centers, but I think looking at this, and I think Ava, in particular, some of the comments you made earlier about existing, you know, uh, 
uh, subdivisions and so on from the 1960s and so on. You know, so even though we look at this example and we have a lot of that in, in this environment here, you know, what are the benefits for centers development happening in that area for the areas immediately uh, adjacent? So, you know, I think part of the conversation we ought to have too is, is the capture area. So, you know, is this creating a situation where, where people in uh, kind of those uh, six, seven to eight dwelling unit per acre neighborhoods that Jack talked about that we're seeing up here on the map are able to get out of their car? No, uh, but again, if the center's successful, you know, it provides a benefit that for them, they may be able to shorten their trip. I mean, it may be something in terms of accessing into their center, and then that's the easy way then to connect from their center elsewhere in the region and, and so on. And it begins uh, to lessen the need. It doesn't eliminate the need to use an automobile, but uh, it allows it to be, you know, just part of uh, the overall trip and travel. So the benefit uh, is in the center, but the benefits in areas immediately adjacent to it as well in, in the travel shed or whatever, if you will. So. So that, I think that's something we have to look at. And if we have areas that are kind of deficient with not having that kind of that central place or something, I think that that's part of the conversation uh, that we need to have as well. So where do those need to be created? I think Jennifer has a comment for us. Well, I'm just thinking about the, the timing of how things work again. I'm sorry to keep bringing you back to that, but it, that's the reality that we're in right now. So this is a discussion that's really related to developing and, and, and updating Metro Vision. How, what's in 2035 related to urban centers and how are they defined and what we expect out of them and do we want to go back to you know, some sort of uh, floor for population and, or excuse me, for, uh, yeah, for housing and, um, and employment. A lot of issues around this. Unfortunately, the tip is going to be you are going to have to put this document together. You're going to have to put tip criteria together, uh, have a policy document adopted by the board in June, and unfortunately, 2040 isn't going to get adopted until at least December of this year. So there's this six-month gap between the two. So um, I, I hear you, and this is an important discussion, and maybe it means that less emphasis is put on urban centers in the TIP criteria that you need to be discussing uh, this evening, but um, I just want to remind you of the situation that we're in, and I, I'm not sure that we can work through all of the urban center issues in time to still stay on the, on the mandated schedule to adopt the TIP. So just I hear you're eager to make some changes. I just don't know if we can make them in time to affect this particular TIP criteria cycle. So I, I do actually want to respond to that because I, I'm struggling with this myself and I actually feel like this understanding of the urban centers is almost crucial to the TIP policy because so much, so many points in the TIP are tied to the urban center. So I respect and hear what you're saying, but I also think this is something we do need to, and I'd like to hear from the rest of the board, but I do feel like this is kind of crucial to the point system for the TIP. So, so help, help me help the board try and balance the two of those things. Um, and I, you know, and I'll open that up to anybody else for any comments along those lines. So, and I, I think Phil had his hand up before, and then I'll go to you, Jack. The, um, Recognizing that we've had a evolution and we may still have an evolution with regard to what defines an activity center, um, I guess from my perspective, I would rather look at um, what are we doing relative to the goal rather than something that fits underneath the title of is it an urban center or is it an activity center? Um, in essence, kind of, you know, are we uh, actually um, going to be dealing with dealing with uh, reduced VMT. And I think some of this eventually gets into measurable components uh, that will help us with MAP21 criteria as we go along. Uh, so rather than putting a label on it, we get into something that's measurable. At least that's some of my initial thinking, um, is, is going back to the, to the goals and having good discussion relative to the, to the goals. Um, 
but looking at, at more of that, that conformance around measurable items that we're going to have to kind of hit at for the MAP 21 component anyway. Jack. Yeah, and, and, and I agree there. I, I think if I could just answer that one thing regarding what we're talking about, 26% of the scoring criteria, since we are going to keep up with a scoring criteria, is measured around how we meet MetroVision. So much of that MetroVision is measured on our compliance in certain point component areas. And that's why I, we're having that greater discussion. And so I'm looking forward to looking at the individual component areas within it, because we already voted it was going to be 26% still, or 26 points or whatever it is. Um, the, the next part of that, I think, is also going to be looking at the individual point criteria within the remaining piece. I don't think, if I can say that, I don't think there's so many, so much agita with those points just in a couple areas as, as there is in the point of do you meet the MetroVision and what those point criteria are. So as we dissect that, I think now that we're more comfortable with understanding this is what this has been great about. It really helps put in perspective of what we're talking about. So I really do appreciate that. And I think as we move forward now, uh, we might be able to, to get a, a greater grasp of what we're trying to address. So it's good. All right. Looks like we're going on to the um, tip, MetroVision tip criteria. You know, the other thing I did want to say is I, we keep talking about the goals, but let's not forget that the 75% of employment that hasn't been factored into that Metro Vision goal either, and I think we've all kind of spoken around that, but not directly to the fact that, yeah, we're close to the 50% housing goal and we're on trend there, but the employment, I, I'm not hearing a lot about that, and that we're close to that goal, or that actually is even a goal that we want to continue with, so just keep that in mind as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this does take us to the MetroVision tip criteria, and we're already having a lively discussion, as we did last week, about this, and that's great. Um, we do hope to, you know, we can accomplish some things that uh, were left open um, from last from from the last meeting. Um, in particular, you know, we would like to hear from you in your discussion as you go forth here to talk about, you know, if there are other goals or policies that um, that you think should be included in the point system. Um, we also would like to have uh, more discussion, if not consensus, on some of the staff recommendations from last from last week on uh, certain uh, tip criteria, and also uh, get your um, get your understanding or impressions on on uh, the proper share of points for for MetroVision criteria as part of the total tip tip conversation. Um, before we do that, though, I would like to just clarify the strategic corridors recommendation that we had last time um, there that was a point of emphasis for some and um, and you know we thought we'd, we'd clarify that uh, for those who don't know there was a recommended by staff that we remove that as a as a as a criteria <coughs> a criterion um, and you know I, I must say out front we don't feel extremely strong about that we saw it as an opportunity to maybe streamline and remove some criteria because um, for, for, for various reasons, one of which we believe that it's really, it's, it's been absorbed into some of the other criteria that, that uh, sets a priority on um, higher level facilities or transit more, or, uh, higher transit frequency corridors. Um, and so, so that was primarily the reason for it. Um, you know, like I said, certain staff is, doesn't, doesn't feel very strongly about that, but I thought we, I try to try to provide you with an explanation as to why that was. And if there's further explanation needed, Steve's here also, that he, he certainly knows the history on the uh, strategic corridors. Anything else on that, Steve? Yes. I guess I still need a little more explanation. I mean, we've frequently talked about, you know, transit-oriented development and in trying to connect land use and uh, mobility so it's not immediately apparent why jettisoning strategic corridors may be changing them if the current set isn't as strategic as, as it could be might make sense, but it feels like we're jettisoning the concept of TOD. And, and it's not just transit, it's also road corridors, right? It's mobility. So your explanation, I appreciate you trying to give one, but I still don't get it. Why, why are we disconnecting and what criteria do you think replace that? Right. Steve, you got comments? Or Brad, I mean, Brad, no. 
Yeah, th there really is no clear yes and no. I mean, this relates to you know, reducing some of the criteria. This is not at all meant to be a disconnect from TOD. There are many other criteria that, you know, I'll just use award points in some form or fashion, directly or indirectly, to transit type developments in our multimodal connectivity. So there are other things that address some of the tenants of these strategic corridors. We are not real strong on this, like we must re remove this. So, you know, we'd be fine retaining this. I think you can just keep the same corridors that are there now. It could be a really long process to redefine things like this. It was just a, an initial suggestion from staff as one place to remove a criteria as one less thing to have to uh, measure and use some judgment on how a project serves the strategic order, but we're just as fine with keeping it. And so I'm on to, which is kind of the sense that we've gotten the last two weeks of just retain this category. One of our other reasons is that there's, there's nowhere in the MetroVision plan or the regional transportation plan that makes reference to these strategic corridors. It was something that was, in essence, made up at a meeting 12 years ago, you know, just to have another definitional thing to add. And so there's no reference in the MetroVision plan or the RTP to these. It's kind of a, the last remnant of reference to this from 10 years ago. but. So if you'll indulge, indulge me as chair, can I just ask you, if you, can you get points for being in an urban center and, and then points for being on, in a, on a strategic corridor? And are you basically getting points for achieving the same thing? If you're in the urban center, it's the transit. So is that why staff is recommending getting rid of it? Because basically we're double counting um, urban center points for lack of a better terminology. Um, so you, you get points because you're in an urban center and then, but you're also on a strategic corridor, so you get those points as well. So in my mind, that just doesn't seem right. And if that's the case, then I would argue we should get rid of it. If there are examples where um, you will only get the, or, or it's an either or, you don't get points for both urban center and strategic corridor, and then you as an entity decide which one you're gonna get. I mean, it seems you can game the system, and we don't wanna be gaming the system. We wanna be awarding points because we're reducing VMTs. Rocky. Yeah, so I think uh, what you just said is where I was last week, uh, totally uh, with it. And again, I think some of the conversation we just had too in terms of the multiple benefits staff was talking about that we're getting with, with centers, you know, let's, let's maybe just focus on one thing and uh, not dilute it. But I think Don, uh, was it last week, who was saying, wait a minute, and, and so on, and that gave me pause. I went back and looked at MetroVision and so on. And, you know, so I'm kind of going in the direction now of let's keep corridors. And I think part of it is is looking at them and looking how a lot of them, you know, have a purpose today. Again, connecting centers that are designated and so on. But, again, it kind of raises a question if, you know, we're seeing that there's some gaps right now and, and we need to kind of continue to enhance it. Uh, those corridors may again be a critical role with where we're at right now in terms of dealing with centers and that overall connectivity in, in the region even along place I think uh, Don was talking about south uh, southern Jefferson County and along Wadsworth Boulevard you know there aren't designated centers there but Wadsworth Boulevard provides a very significant role in terms of connectivity the other thing I looked at is what Metro Vision does in terms of identifying some of these corridors for future uh, high capacity mobility. So, I, you know, it doesn't talk technology yet, but it's kind of after fast tracks, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a point in time when we are after fast track. You know, it identifies Highway 85 uh, as a significant corridor, and that, you know, that may be something that falls into our family of high capacity corridor movement in the future. Wadsworth is shown uh, playing that role. Hampton Avenue is showing playing that role. So there's a little bit of me that uh, 
you know, if, if there's some value with that corridor thing, again, l let's give it a little bit more definition. If there's some obsoleteness, let's address that and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So. Don. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm a little concerned that uh, Jack and Eva are agreeing, and I'm agreeing with Rocky. Um, I think I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket. Uh, but um, I, I thank you, Rocky, because when when I look at strategic corridors and they are connecting those urban centers, those those activity centers together, and it's they're very important. They're a, a, a very instrumental part of our entire you know system that we deal with, and I don't want to discount to get rid of them and especially when we're when we're considering there's corridors that are identified as urban centers so um, you know if the 470 corridor is an urban center so if we get rid of the corridor I, I, I agree with you Jackie in the sense that double dipping should not be allowed at all so you either get credit for the urban center or the corridor not both and but but if we get rid of the the strategic corridor in this case that's a whole urban center for us right right so i guess when i look to staff is there a way that we could structure this so you get points either for being in an urban center or for being a strategic corridor and i think chris has a comment before you respond actually i just have a question um are, are all urban centers on a strategic corridor no. no. so you have a bunch of urban centers that aren't on a strategic right. corridor but you have some urban centers that are on a strategic corridor um, I don't know why I mean if you say double dipping it sounds bad but you know unless it's, it's ice cream it, fair point <laughs> <laughs> I mean there's value in the urban center and there's a reason to place projects there right there's value in corridors not all strategic corridors are urban centers there's values in strategic corridors so we want to place projects there and if you got an urban center that is on a strategic corridor by god there's two reasons to place a project there i don't know why you wouldn't reward being both i don't understand why you'd want to say well you can only be an urban center you can only be a strategic corridor if if, if if you're actually hitting two things that are important, why wouldn't you want to increase your investment there? I, I just don't get it. Kathy. Particularly Where since they don't all overlap. You have urban centers that aren't strategic corridors. You have st don't strategic corridors that aren't urban centers. Kathy. If they did overlap, it would be cheaper. Well, if, if the goal is to help us achieve our goals, rewarding projects with financial you know help that are going to uh, do it is is great but if you're going to give all the money to one project then we're not going to get those other projects which help us achieve our goals so to me if you're spreading it out a bit then you may get to your goals better but if everything goes to one project you're only going to be able to get so much air quality control um, air quality improvement out of that project but if you perhaps can help uh, you know two different projects you may get more results from that so I guess what when you're saying why shouldn't they be get if they have both why shouldn't they get more money because then that's not helping us increase our goals it's just helping one goal um, be more financially um, helped Suzanne? I see everyone looking perplexed. No, I, I, I don't think I explained I that you, well. Kathy. But yeah. does the criteria mean you get more money, or just means you're the top of the list to get funded? Well, I mean, you're the top yeah. on the list, list to, get, to get funded. Get more, so that doesn't mean that the other projects don't get funded. They're just but you could be prioritizing the one that's the twofer. But you could be. It could be we run out of money before you get to the ones that aren't twofers. I mean, I think that's a possibility, but I also think you're double counting. You're getting the same benefit, and that it, potentially, and you're not always going to, and I respect what Chris was saying. You know, sometimes maybe you are receiving twice the benefit. I would argue that's not always the case, 
that you, you expand a project to be strategic and take advantage of being able to get additional points. And, um, and, and uh, to, to Kathy's point, you know, if, if you know, you're going to get, quite honestly, let's face it, guys, from the last tip cycle, one point was the difference between some projects. One point was whether or not a project got funded or didn't get funded. So, you know, it really is. It really does make a difference. So in my mind, this double counting issue, the threat of, be, you know, it's a value judgment, the threat of double counting, really not seeing twice the benefit but getting twice the points, does that outweigh the, the um, point Kathy made we're not funding as many projects or not as many entities are getting funded. So go ahead, Chris. I would just say I, I, I know what you're saying, and, and I, I, don't, I don't disagree, but, you know, all this, all these are, these are proxies. I mean, if we really wanted to do this right, we would look at every single project. Yes. And we would assess them, uh, you know, from scratch about what, you know, how, how much does this project achieve the MetroVision goals, and we'd look at each one. But that's just way too much work. And so we've come up with a set of proxies, and the proxies won't be perfect, but we call out urban centers, and we want to concentrate projects in urban centers for a reason. And we call out strategic corridors, and we want to concentrate projects in strategic corridors for a reason. And it could be that a project that double dips is double dipping, and it's cheating, and it doesn't actually have that much impact. But we got to, at, at some point, we have to trust the proxies that we've chosen and live with the um, imprecision that comes with using a proxy rather than making a value judgment with each and every project. Phil. I might actually turn to uh, staff to maybe educate us, at, and not necessarily tonight. Um, is it more work? Uh, because as we look at map 21 and having to establish measurable criteria um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's gonna it's gonna necessarily be additional work versus the proxies <laughs> any other comments uh, yeah I'll we'll have Sue and then Suzanne um, so I'm listening to all these comments and and saying to myself but I think the whole process is a pretty imprecise process. We've just had a discussion that says that we have all these urban centers. They vary widely in definition. They're not all going to achieve the same results if we put a project there, and yet they're going to get the same po points because they're designated as an urban center. So as we go through this, the challenge we're going to have, and it's certainly not an easy one, otherwise we would finish at the last meeting. Um, but it is that we're trying to get a level playing field and the objective is to say the projects that most contribute to our visions and goals, the reduction of, of uh, or, or the increase in air, I was going to say reduction of pollution, but, you know, increase in air quality, the, um, the decrease in congestion, all, all those things that we're looking for. As we focus on this point process, I think it's really important for us to focus on what things get us that? Whether it's an urban center project or a project that Eva's talking about or a rural town center project that, that just stops traffic, and we've talked about some of those here. That's a challenge, but that's what we really have to focus on. And so does giving us a point for signing the Mile High Compact do that? Does that have any impact on the, on the end result? Um, does giving a point for a, a urban center and a point if it's on the corridor do that to, to Kathy's point? Will we get any more out of that project in terms of the ultimate goals because it's on a strategic corridor? If so, then it probably should get another point. I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but if not, then no, it shouldn't get another point. So I think we really need to keep focused on those high goals as we go through. And if we ask ourselves every time we're allocating a point, is this, we're allocating this point because is this going to get us further along in achieving our goals? If it does, yes. If it doesn't, no. Suzanne. Well, I totally agree with that. 
I think that's very well said. Um, I was just going to ask a, a more mundane question, which is, do we have a map of strategic corridors and a, a de firm definition? And, and we were looking for it, and we didn't yeah, see it. Yeah, if you look in the packet from last week, um, last it, week. there was ah, it. Last uh, week. Last week. There was a, the strategic corridors, but, but there's a big... <laughs> yeah, a big X in it, or a null sign on it. Well, but you can kind of get a sense of what they are well, it, it, still. It, at least they do this to you, Susan, but it's also in the Come tip. Come on, this is very legible. It's uh, also in the tip calculation policy guide, if you go to it. It's there identified. And I guess, uh, you know, I would ask staff, um, obviously we're struggling with this issue. One of the questions I have is how many, how many projects that were funded yeah. got points for being both a, uh, a uh, urban center and a strategic corridor. So. I, you might, you probably don't have that information right now, but, but if you could get that, I think that would be valuable information for us to have some sense of how many points were awarded to one project, you know, for being both an urban center and a strategic corridor. Gotcha. Um, and, and, I, and I actually think Sue raised a great point. Um, are we, are we finished with this discussion before I move us from this? Do you think if we get, get that information from staff, is there any other information from staff the group would like to see on um, the urban center strategic corridor discussion? <laughs> Jack. Yeah, there is. If you look at the information that was passed out under uh, Appendix F, you start seeing how the points were calculated and how they're actually attributed to uh, within an urban center. And the first one Jack, is... Let me just stop you for a second. Appendix F from last week, not this week, okay. correct? Is that it, what you're referring to? No, it's to? one that was handed out actually today, and it's in this document. Okay, sorry. I want to make sure and we're all looking at the Go to the same. back. I believe it was in there. Let's see. E. e. That's the project list. And F was the... No. Okay, D. Attachment D, everyone. Sorry, I want us all on the same page. Um, it's... Yeah, it's the problem with that one is that it doesn't calculate it as well, and it might be last week's. So I'm just going to put it to you in a different way. Okay. okay. Since we all don't have access to what I'm looking at, which is the <laughs> actual tip policy calculation guide, within there they have under Appendix F, I'm sure I had that. Maybe it was from last week. It I was, was just looking week. at it. It's last, it's last week's. That's it. Thank you. That last document right there. Right, okay. last week. There. Now, when you look at that, and this is where I want, I think, I was hoping we were going to get our discussion headed to. When we start looking at how these points are calculated, and I want you to notice something here that I'm trying to understand. Somebody's got to educate me because you know what? I was at the table when this was done. I didn't understand it then. I don't understand it now. And I voted that no then. So here's the key. Six points for an urban center within a quarter mile of a rapid transit center. Now, just follow me for a minute. Five points for an urban center serving within 15-minute headways. That means you've got a bus route that's got 15-minute headways. Then you've got four points for an urban center with the transit with headways of 30 minutes, okay? And then two points forever and zero for everything else. Now, six points, quite frankly, if you really look at it, is 25% of the entire metro point calculation on part of this, um, almost 25%. But here's the point. I find it ironic, so if you're within a quarter of a mile of a transit center, you get higher points for road projects to get to the transit center. Am I right? But yet we're not, so the transit center in itself is reducing the air quality aspects that we're trying to accomplish. And this is why I'm saying, why are we using quarter headway? What, those things, what we've done is we've become exclusionary very quickly. And now this is where the argument of urban centers is actually focused around. Is that all of a sudden now, you've got to be an urban center, but now you've got to be an urban center with these constraints within it. And these constraints then, I can tell you that map decreases very quickly very quickly. And now only the entities within the within a arm's reach of these criteria begin to get points. And I have to tell you, now we're talking about significant point scoring criteria. And that's why I'm wanting to have that discussion is what do we think, and back to Sue's statement, which is how does that get us, I'm trying to understand how that gets us to our goal of awarding points to someone to do their projects that are already in a transit center. Now, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. So you get higher points in an area within a quarter mile of a transit. Now, I'm trying to help me with that one. I'm struggling with it. Rocky's going to help you. 
another uh, uh, day or two to work through all of that. Mm -hmm. I guess there's part of it is uh, I think I think Jack's on to something here a little bit. I mean, uh, are these criteria actually talking about the quality of the project in terms of helping the center be all it can be? And you right. guys have heard me that term a little bit. So, you know, is, is how is that factored in? So if the criteria, again, are just you know, proximity, bus headways, and so on. You know, how does it actually help? Is this a project that helps us with that last mile connection? Is this a project that helps leverage certain types of housing uh, there? You know, I, I'm aware of places, for example, where we've had park and rides that get capped and evolved into structures with affordable housing. I mean, home run for a project like that, as opposed to something that just is, you know, Putting a road that hadn't been there before in, in, an, in an urban center. So somehow I, I think you're onto something here. You know, do we do we need to uh, <laughs> uh, dig a, a little deeper with this? I want to also reflect the conversation I had quickly with Kathy at the end of a uh, uh, meeting last time. I mean, if she's got a central place in her city, and you know they once had RTD service and now they don't have RTD service. I mean, is there something where this process is recognizing they've got the bones of what they need to be a, a successful s center, and should this process be used to leverage for them to get that transportation component in there that they need to be even more successful? So, and how does that get reflected here? So, now I'm saying that also being mindful with what Jennifer's doing, being kind of, uh, uh, you know, coach and, and, and guide for us here, I, you know, do we really have the time to fix a lot of these things? So there's a little bit of me that wants to fall back on that rich information we got from staff. It seems like, by and large, the tip process that we've been using it, even though it's got warts and bruises and, and, and lumps, if you will, you know, is, is helping us get to goals. So, you know, what do we really do, I think, strategically around this table with, with the time we have to Get, get at some of these big problems. And, and Jack, I'd say this is one worth spending some time on to, to see if, if we can't fix it. Right. Uh, yeah. No. yeah. And Jack. I will explain why and then thank you because now we're getting down to the essence of the issue because I'll tell you what happens. I now can do a road maintenance problem project, do an overlay project, not even a capacity operational safety issue. I can submit for an overlay project and get points. Folks, should we even have overlays and maintenance as part of this criteria? Because I now I'm getting not having to use my general fund to maintain my transit centers. So there's my point, and that's what we're getting to. Shouldn't the dollars be used to help somebody get to a transit center, or the dollars help somebody become a transit center and become maybe a park and ride center versus rewarding those who already have it? Yeah. And by the way. I got it. So I'm going to tell you something truly. I mean, we got the end of the line. So that's all I'm saying. But I'm going to tell you what I really like about this conversation is, man, I can't wait. I won't, you know, the tip, the next tip conversation is going to be a regional discussion, and this is beautiful from that standpoint. So. This is that conversation, Jack. <laughs> Eva. I also wanted to add is the fact that a lot of it is served by transit, served by transit, and we're all at the mercy of RTD. So right. I wanted to add that. One, one thing, and in, in going back to the scoring system, which I think what staff wants us to go to, <laughs> there's one that just kind of that, that really sticks, and I think we need to get rid of it completely, and that is one, po one point if the project is within one half mile of DIA boundaries. Now, how many people are sitting here at the table is one half mile of DIA. Okay, I'm talking about regionalism. Aren't you proud of me? It, it, it happens occasionally. <laughs> when I see inequities, it's an, it's an inequity. And we've heard that comment before, Eva. I think that's a, a, something that's sh shared, and I know um, I, I tend to agree with you on this one. So, but, but I also understand that it's an employment center. So in my mind, it should be getting points, not because you're within 
next to DIA, you, you should be getting points because you're an employment center. So, and, and perhaps so where, so, and, and those points should be available to anyone that meets that criteria. It, it shouldn't say DIA, right. it should say employment center. And, and, and right, because I would argue Park Meadows Mall is also an employment center. There's plenty of people driving there, you know, to work and shop. So, uh, how, you know, what's, what's fair is fair. So how can we rewrite this to capture what we all want to achieve and that, yes, we understand the validity and value in projects that serve an entity that's got 20,000 people working there, but DIA isn't the only project that fits that, cri or the only area that fits that criteria, so how can we write something that's, that's fair? Centennial Airport, for goodness sakes, well, I mean, let's talk about the jobs and people moving in and out of that facility, so should we get po points there, Suzanne? Um, it, if what you're saying is true that it's only there because it's an employment center, then that seems to have merit. I'm just curious, is it because of the number of people that go in and out to fly? I, I mean, because, I, I, I mean, I only ask when it that if, it, if it's about moving people. I mean, we all benefit from DIA functioning well Absolutely. and all of our people and our tourists and our, everybody getting in and out. And if it's about making that re that airport function better for all of us in terms of transit, that's different than an employment center. So it would be useful to know what the rationale was behind that. Uh, Sue has a comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Yeah. The airport is responsible for all of anything that's done on airport property. And those funds can't be used by the city. And I mean, it is a separate entity. So when we say half a mile from the airport, we're not talking about anything in that transportation piece. We can't be, because I'm the boundary. pretty sure that's federal. It's outside the um, we're talking about development that's adjacent to the airport. And so that would be commercial, housing, business, whatever. I don't know why that has, and, and I spent a lot of time at that airport, but I don't know why that it should get any points, just because it's right by the airport. It should get points for all the other reasons that anything else would get points. If it's an urban center, swell. If it's, you know. Strategic corridor, I don't any know. Any of those things. Employment center, great. But not just because it's DIA. Because DIA has to fund, federally has to fund its own projects, and it has an excess of money because it just hikes its fees to the airlines, um, and that money can't be used by the city of Denver. I'm sure they'd love to. Jason. Thank you. Um, and I don't remember when we went through this last time. Uh, 2010. Go ahead. No, no. Well, I remember it was 2010, but I can't remember why we came up with a point for DIA. But I will tell you that, yes, Sue's correct in terms of the funding, what's going to happen inside the fence. But when you look outside the fence, uh, Commerce City is a prime example. We have the entire north and entire west fence of that airport. Our friends in Aurora have a significant piece of that south fence. So there really and truly are two municipalities that fall into that criteria. I don't know how we managed to get a point for what would really be only two cities that could benefit. Um, and are we talking? What are we talking about in terms of DIA? Because technically, all of Pena Boulevard is DIA when we get right down to it. I mean, if you, yep, anybody that's exactly. get, getting on and off of Pena Boulevard sees the little, you are entering Denver International Airport terrain. So that's right. So now you're talking about a half mile of the entire Pena corridor, which means it could benefit things like the, uh, the, the DIA line at the bend in Pena at Pena and Tower. I mean, so there are certainly a number of things that make sense in terms of benefit. When I think about off airport, outside the fence uh, incentives, there are significant properties to be developed around the airport that, um, and this is the whole airport cities discussion, which we won't get into. But um, there are there are transportation quarters that are they're going to have to be established to enable that to become the employment center that it can be due to its adjacent, ad, it, the fact that it's adjacent to the airport itself. So I don't know, I can't remember, Jack, why that one point came to be when we talked through this in 2010. Because but Bill Bedall was one hell of a negotiator. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, thank God he's gone. Uh, I, I, I do think there is support if we can come up with rationale that's applicable to the rest of the jurisdictions, um, but can we, can we ask staff to take a look at that? Is there, what, Jack, do you have a comment? No, just one thing I want to say. Also, part of, our, I think, the objective when we looked at, we said we wanted to relook at the dip was to simplify this thing. 
So let's don't be afraid to take something out when we can't understand it. It, it really and truly. So, right, and so it's okay to say, you know what, let's just take something out and take things out that shouldn't be there. Um, I mean, there's part of this process for us to better understand it. So some of this stuff, maybe it's a rewrite. Some of it's maybe it's convincing it. And some of it's maybe it's just doing away with it. Okay? But. So do we have. Um, yeah, I would make a motion that we actually remove this particular item from the criteria. This is to remove the one point for the uh, project location related to the Denver International Airport. There's a motion and a second. Um, should we just take a vote? Let's just vote. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 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 And uh, abstain? Okay. Pardon? Okay. Who is? Oh, Jason. Jason. Okay. I thought Jack was. I was like, Didn't... all right. Uh, <laughs> Sue. So while we're on a roll, okay. I would move that we remove the one point for signing the Mile High Compact. Second. Is so discussion on that, yes. Please. So historically, correct my memory, wasn't this about um, agreeing to abide by the, the um, it, whether or not the urban growth boundary got expanded? And I guess I'm, I think of this as something entirely different than the criteria on DIA. Um, and there are a whole lot of the MetroVision goals that attach themselves to the benefits from a compact development pattern and the regional cooperation um, that's associated with deciding as a group what that development pattern is, it looks like. So to me, I, I think of that as a really useful criteria, although one that shouldn't be hard for most people to get. Um, so I, maybe I could ask the staff to provide a perspective on that because maybe my history is a little dusty on that. Oh, no, um, I, I would say that it is different from the DIA point because we actually know where this came from. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, the Mile High Compact was uh, a, a landmark document, again, national model. I know you've heard that a couple of times this evening, but it is true. And basically what the signers of the, the compact uh, are agreeing to, and I'll defer to Pat to correct me on anything because she was probably on the board when um, we brought, when the, a number of communities uh, came, uh, signed the compact. But it does say that you will adopt and adhere to an urban growth boundary. It says that um, your comp plans will, um, will be reflective of the uh, applicable uh, MetroVision tenants, uh, that you will talk to your neighbor when you're getting ready to do development uh, next to their boundary and try to work through issues, that you'll be respectful of, um, of um, each other's uh, uh, planning um, opportunities. What else am I leaving out? There's, there's another thing I think that I've got. But um, this basically says that I agree to work closely with my, my neighbors. I agree to uh, try to uh, make sure that I'm doing my part as a jurisdiction to see that the region grows um, smart, that we preserve open space. Um, we focus on uh, growing up more than we focus on uh, on growing out. So those those are the types of things that are in MetroVision and about uh, 90, a little over 90 percent of the region's population is in a jurisdiction that signed the Mile High Compact. Sue. So I agree a hundred percent with all of those principles. I just think it's the principle that ought to be awarded points, not whether you signed the compact. So if you want to have a criteria, and I don't, does some, I don't have them all memorized, does something somewhere say is it within the UGB? If not, maybe, okay. So there's already, there are already points for that. So, so I think you encompass the principles in there, but you don't do extra points because you signed the piece of paper. 
So if we award points if you're within the UGB to begin with, I think we got that one covered. And while I think the other piece of it, everybody should be doing, again, those points need to get us to the goals that we're talking about. And that means reduction in VMT, uh, you know, reduction in pollution, and I don't think just signing the compact did that. So that's why I, I raised it. I, I don't disagree with the principles, and so if you think we need that in there to ensure that people are adhering to the principles, fine, but I think there are other ways to do that. I, I have Rocky, and then I'll go to you, Elise. So I, I was just going to ask a question, but wow, I, I'm really impressed with what Sue said here. I, I, I'm intrigued with this whole idea of, you know, are there actual principles in the compact that become factors for uh, evaluating a, a project? I, I, I think there's, there's something to what she's putting on the table. The question I wanted to pose, and again, uh, maybe this is something to answer uh, at a subsequent meeting or something, but I understand there's a little history too before that, that uh, part of the reason we ended up with the Mile High Compact is again some of the uh, discussions at some point about creating uh, state mandated legislation and it was an agreement that this region said, you know, we're, we're the growth machine in the state and if we come up with a way to do smart growth and growth management, some, some of what Jack talked about, here and, and we've got a mechanism for, for doing that, you know, we'd rather have that approach than have something uh, mandated on us. So I think it's important to not lose that and again just how do we carry forward, carry that forward best in our uh, planning and decision making. So, Elise and then I'm going to go to Jason and then I'm going to go to Jack. Well, I mean, part of the history is that blood has been shed every time we've had to deal with the urban growth boundary and whether or not to expand it. And the Mile High Compact really, in its day, was a litmus test for whether or not you are, uh, believe in regionalism and are willing to, um, as you look out for what's best for community, do so in partnership with folks in the region. And. Uh, I'm loath to lightly get rid of that. Um, and your point about the urban growth boundary I think is very well taken, but that just uh, deals with the project. It doesn't deal with the jurisdiction. So you could be um, deciding not to adhere to mile high, the mile high Compact, pushing out the urban growth boundary for the region and still applying and qualifying for points for building a project that happens to be within the urban growth boundary. So I don't think it's, it's quite a one for one. And it could be that there's another way to account for that regional cooperation and a commitment to a, a compact development pattern for the, for the region in, in lieu of Mile High Compact. But right now, that's, I think, the surrogate for that. So I guess if, if we're going to get rid of that criteria, I think we need to have it somewhere else in this document. So, Jason. I think I was thinking along the same lines as Elise. I mean, are they, in looking over the criteria, are there elements of what was in the Mile High Compact that aren't here as an explicit item? And do you bring them individually into the criteria so that you deal with them on an item by item basis as opposed mm -hmm. to, hey, you signed the compact, we're going to give you credit overall, when to your point, maybe your project is going against something that you've agreed to in the Mile High Compact. Does that make sense? Sort of parsing it out so that you're looking at that project and taking the criteria that we want to achieve and awarding or not points at that level? Jennifer has a comment. On I think the, the, the board put Mile High Compact in here, one, so that it wouldn't have to put all the detail in here because it's so complicated as it is to understand all of these things. and. Honestly, uh, it just pits Dr. Cog's staff against your staff debating whether or not these things did or didn't get done. And so by putting the Mile High Compact in, it is only the one point, and it's, it covers a litany of things. Um, I'm so, oh, is it two? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think that that's, that was the rationale, that to put all of that stuff in there and then have to verify uh, that, yeah. 
it's it's a tough it's a tough call i know jack well i don't know how many of you've read the mile high compact i, I would go back and read it again it's kind of an interesting document yeah. um, when you look at it which is good it's a good comprehensive planning tool and you're looking at it. um but however I, I think the tenets of the mile high compact if any one of us have a planning department today we all comply with it. We all have a comprehensive master plan. We all have things that the question now becomes, okay, so what percentage of, of, of do I, of all the tenants that are laid out within the Mile High Compact, which are a bunch, by the way, it's not a page, um, then the question is, okay, which one do you have to apply to every one of the tenants or just sign it? Um, that thing I quite find interesting, it's a voluntary document, by the way. Oh, is it? Really? You're paying me to sign it? Is that voluntary? But anyhow, the point there is now is that I think that the tenets that we're talking about are laid out within MetroVision. And MetroVision in itself covers the goals that we're trying to accomplish. The Mile High Compact doesn't have the, the reverse effect of MetroVision goals written into Mile High Compact. The other thing is if you read the Mile High Compact, it's all about MetroVision 2020. Yeah. It's all about Steve. everything else that was then. And plus, we were trying to create an atmosphere back then, and, and I do remember back then, which was more teaming, partnering, regionalism, getting us back on space on how we do the planning and everything. Nothing in here is binding to UGB. Frankly, um, there's a lot of entities that have UGB percentage and goals, and that's the whole big fight we had four years ago when people were trying to get beyond it. But there is an acknowledgement that you will abide by it, and many entities have. But ironically, Quite frankly, I, unique the, the largest amount of UGB growth that's left right now is Roar in Denver, and they've got basically was they got a bank. I'll just put it that way, um, and um, so I don't know. I think taking it out of the tip doesn't hurt anything. I don't understand why it's in there. To me, it just convolutes it, uh, and it's just if you're going through an acrimonial check the box and move on. Okay, and I don't understand why we're doing that at this point in time. So that's why I second the motion, and I would recommend maybe we need to do a separate exercise if people want to, because I have a different perspective, which is why do we have the Mile High Compact? Okay. And if we have it, why don't we update the Mile High Compact? And so that's where my point is. So we need to update it, period. All right, I'm going to take Phil, and then is there anybody else that wants to comment on this before we vote? And I, Suzanne, okay, is there anybody else? I might make a comment too. Go ahead. Yeah, I, and uh, I'll uh, endeavor to be brief. It's a dated document. Uh, it came out in August of 2000. Uh, I actually put the question to our city staff uh, today on whether the city had signed it because it predated my involvement with the city. And they didn't know. Uh, so um, uh, I, I'm in favor of taking it out in that it's a dated document. It refers to antiquated. Uh, elements that um, I don't think folks actually know or don't know. Either you're living with it and uh, as far as its principles, but the Mile High Compact itself, uh, unless you're going to say, hey, we're going to update it and, and move you know, some of the things that are in Metro Vision and move that out and then look th at that as kind of your litmus test document, but I would take it out for now. Okay. Suzanne. Well, I guess given the history and given what it stands for and given that it's all about regional cooperation and compact growth patterns and things that we hold very dear, I think if we're trying to make things simpler, I think the simpler way is to keep it in than try to take it out, well then to take it out and make sure that it's referenced in multiple other places in here. So I guess I'm kind of curious that I feel like we're going to make things more complicated, not less complicated. And I don't think regional cooperation, um, I hear what you say about it being a dated document, but those are not dated concepts. I think it's very important to us still. So I guess I would. That provision 2020. Um, I guess I would, I would vote to leave it in. OK. Eva. I, I'd like to make a suggestion, actually, is, is take those two points and put them to um, community plans that connect to a metro vision. You know, I, I'm going to have Jennifer respond to that. Not opposed to that. We would just need some really um, tight guidance on how that would be established. If it's just a yes or no, that's fine. Just understand that staff are not going to be able to 
go out and, and, and check to see if jurisdictions have done that. That's why this is so cut and dry. We, we clearly understand you either signed it or you haven't. A and I completely understand that probably every jurisdiction in uh, the Dr. Cog uh, region is adhering to varying degrees to the tenets of the Mile High Compact. But I think you either need to take it out or, or leave it in. Our recommendation, obviously, is to leave it in. It is a legacy um, um, agreement about regionalism and cooperation and collaboration. But to try to um, put in some sort of surrogate, please understand that staff is not going to be able to, to go out and verify. So if people check off that, yes, they're doing these things, we're just going to assume that's the case and move on. Um, I, I, we, we are going long in this discussion. I want to make sure everyone is heard. Is there, any, is there any new information that somebody would like to contribute? Okay. I just wanted to respond to Eva, if I could. So. Yes, you, of course you can, Rocky. Okay, sorry. Uh, you and I are going to be best friends. I think we are. So, yeah, I, I think my first preference would be to keep it in. But I think Eva offers something. I think maybe, Jennifer, if we create those points, you know, the responsibilities on the applicant uh, to demonstrate it, and we should accept that that's honest information provided in, in good faith, you know, so that you're not having to police it. So, and in that respect, it, uh, this is my comment. I, I did say I was going to make one. Is that in my mind, then just leave it in the way it is. Why are we trying that? To me, taking it out to Suzanne's point makes it more complicated. If mm -hmm. so, um, it, it, you know, and Sue would like to. Uh, and the only thing I want to uh, two things. First, I, I, not for one minute do I want to diminish the importance of the Mile High Compact. And I, I would like to encourage everybody. I, I, I don't think Bennett signed it because I think it was before Bennett was involved in all this stuff. So <laughs> I'd be delighted to sign it. But I, the thing is, the way it is now, if we give award points for having signed it, you don't have to be adhering to it with this project at all. Oh, for all you have to do is say, hey, I signed it, and, and I'm okay. I just, I just think the compact and its principles are really important. I don't think in this context it's getting us what we want. I don't know that we have to put other things in. I just don't think this gets us what we want. Okay, we have a motion on the table to remove this, uh, these two points, and it was seconded, so uh, and, and I'm going to call for a vote on that. So I think I think it's going. I'd like you to raise your hands on this one because. So all those who are voting to remove the mile high compact points, please raise your hand. All of those who oppose the motion, please raise your hand. And then is there anyone, uh, excuse me, abstaining from this vote? Okay, the motion fails. Um, but along those lines, I have one I'd like to bring up, and it's the urban growth boundary. And um, right now, three points if the project is entirely within the urban growth boundary, and you get one point if the project is partially within the urban growth boundary. In my mind, this is a black and white issue. You're either in or you're not in. You get, it's a yes, no, you get points or you don't get points. So I'd like to throw that out next for discussion by the group. And Jennifer's going to tell me why it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask Steve or Doug, whoever could. I, I know that we've had at least um, uh, one situation where to complete the, the project, it crossed through an unincorporated area. But um, I don't know who can, who can yeah, I, well, Brad, I'll, maybe Brad is, even. Uh, I'll just explain. The reason it's written like that, uh, Madam Chair, is that think of the UGB as Swiss cheese, not as a solid entity, right? So there are oftentimes the way that it's set up, there will be holes, and so you could have a corridor that is ultimately running through maybe some open space or something else where there is not UGB <laughs> designated um, that would then be considered not entirely within. So we recognize there are some odd things that happen every now and then with UGB and the way that it is actually mapped that Oftentimes you have projects that are ultimately contained within sort of that footprint, but it are, they are running through areas that for whatever reason are not currently um, have UGB assigned to them. So that, that's why that whole 
to your black and white. That's why there's that slight little gray area to make sure if that circumstance comes in, that, that, that project could receive points for being um, within the UGB at least partially. I don't even The staff is, is re uh, well, has modified the language to some degree to try to calm some of that ambiguity that, was, that we had in the past. Well, um, partially, I guess, is what I'm struggling with. Partially, so if it just clips the UGB, it gets a point. To me, the majority of, if it's a whole, that's one thing. If both sides of the project and there's a gap in the middle, now Sue's going to tell me why. <laughs> some towns are partially within the UGB boundary and partially outside the UGB boundary were one. So if we were to do a project all in the town of Bennett, um, part of the town of Bennett is our six miles isn't in the UGB boundary. So, so they, it could be contiguous and, and go, it's not like it's outside, it's not in Dr. Cog's area. So I, that to me is a different scenario if you're not within the Dr. Cog region. I, but part of us, I, I think that project, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, that project would then come in and be considered partially within the UGB boundary because well, the piece that was in the UGB would, and then when we ca cross Kiowa Creek, even though the project is contiguous. But can you get Dr. Cobb funds for that project? Can you get Dr. Cobb funds for something not being that you get, How can you get Dr. Cobb? It is. Right, right but then. I know, but wouldn't it be considered partially? But that's the only part. Do you be coming to the? That, that's the only part that could be funded. That's all you would be applying for for the funds within the UGB. Well, then holes are one thing in my mind. But if it's but if a project that's not you know this the way this is written a project that has a little piece within and then purposefully is outside the UGB can get point can get a point, and I don't think that's right. So, Jack. I was going to give you one example where we've got to, at least to do anything, if you're going to keep the thing, then you're going to have to fix how we calculate it because we lost the point because Chatfield Reservoir, right, Chatfield Reservoir wasn't on in the UGB. So now, build a house on that baby someday, but because we didn't get enough calculation in it, we, we didn't get, we lost the point. I mean, that, that's the point that's crazy. All right. The floating <laughs> center. It's Hong Kong. Um, do, do you guys think you understand the essence of what we're trying? Is there a better way to write this to, to um, encompass? It's about gaps. Pardon? It originally had percentages in the, oh, I'm looking at the red line yes. version. Yeah. So you're looking at the clean version, I'm looking at the red line version. It used to read three points if the project is at least 90% contained and one point if it was at least 40% contained. Right. So they took out the percentages and put in words that it could be down to 1%. So perhaps you go back to the, was it was originally. Zero points, yeah. Right, less. I think it should be at least 50%. I mean, if the project is not in the urban growth bound, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not hearing a reason why, if there's a hole in the project, in my mind, then... Well, the hole counts, because it's, if you were doing a road around Cherry Creek Reservoir, yeah, a lot of that would not be in the urban growth boundary, but the entire road would be, but when you're looking at the land mass that you're trying to get around, it counts against you. And just by looking at the map, there's a lot of those weird holes. So if you want to say, unless there's a hole, does that unless what you want to say? A, unless there's a body of water. Or, or some How about a weird body hole? of water? Okay. Well, I'm well, just you, wondering, uh, it's not in, unfrequent in land use to treat enclaves differently than outside the, the final perimeter, which it feels like is the distinction you're trying to make, where you're really violating the spirit of the urban growth boundary versus having to go through an enclave that's completely surrounded by UGB lands. And maybe that's the distinction you could make. All right, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other uh, specific <laughs> uh, MetroVision uh, implementation evaluation criteria that they would like to bring up and discuss? 
Jack. I, I don't. I just want to make sure I want to go back to. Are we going to give direction to staff or ask staff to come back with something different on that very first one, this quarter? The urban quarters. We're, I think we're going to come back to that at the end. So let's okay. let's do so, let, let's have that discussion. But is there any? Are there? Right. Well, in urban centers and how we're going to deal with how, what the next step on that is going to be. But are there any uh, any of these other? Um, you know, we've discussed the UGB, we've discussed the DIA, we've discussed the Mile High Compact. Are there any of those other ones that I, Elise, and then I will go to you, Rocky. Well, to that, we didn't explicitly discuss is whether or not to add in rural town centers, which is in the staff recommendation, um, which I think I'm fine with doing. Yeah, I don't know. Do we have a better The staff. We do. I'm sorry, here it is. I didn't think Just we had put it. it up there. Oh, I see. Okay. I apologize. I okay, didn't think we so had it. Okay, so are we on? I think it's helpful if we so have the, the first, red line. very first box to, that we get to deals with whether or not we want to add, provide some points for being a rural town center. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> and do we have, do you want to make a comment on that, Elise, or you just want to? I think it's an important important point and I didn't want us to skip over it um, I, I think that what we heard certainly last week in the discussion is that the Metro vision needs to paint a picture of a vision for um, our desired future for urban areas certainly but also suburban areas rural areas and this by adding in rural town centers that helps focus resources in those rural spots, and that seems like that makes sense. So I'd be supportive. Rocky. Yeah, and uh, that was the issue I wanted to raise too. So I'm happy making a motion, if that's appropriate, to amend the family of centers to include uh, rural town centers. Okay. Does anyone else want to speak to that, Jack? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to point out a rural town center will never get six, five, or four. Well, I. I and I, I have a comment to make on, regarding that, but Chris, did you have something else? Just if we're going to do that, the the zero point bullet would have to be changed. So zero points if the project is not in or within a proximity of an urban center, rapid transit station, or rural town center. Rural town center. Okay. Um, do we want to talk about specific points, or do we want to just include the concept that we want to include rural town centers? Rocky. Yeah, so as maker of the motion, I don't know if there's a second yet. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think my thought is let's bring it in into uh, the, category. The, the category here. And again, I think this is a category we talked earlier may need some additional work. So when we do that additional work, let's address how rural town center gets points uh, in, in that process. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Okay, that's great. Let's move on to the next one. Recognizing we will have a further discussion at the end, maybe on this, on next steps. So, do you want to go through it, or does everyone understand? Does somebody want to make a motion? People well, are. I, I can tell you what I have prepared to talk about if it's of interest to the group. I have something that explains sort of the rationale as to why staff made its recommendation. And I don't know if that's of interest to the group or not. Yes, it is. Okay. Let's do that. So this largely goes to the first, the first two boxes that was on the previous thing. So that the six points, um, that's urban centers and do you have a transit center, that sort of thing, or what's the headway situation, and also the box below it that's the, that's the four points. Um, so to kind of give you some history of this, um, when this came up last time, so the 2010 time frame, um, Dr. Huck, Dr. Cog actually hosted a meeting with local staff to help us think through how we would actually prioritize this. And so that's really where the whole framework came from, was a conversation with local staff about how we would prioritize urban centers and rapid, rapid transit stations within uh, the TIP policy. So we're sort of doing our best to sort of carry forward um, that conversation. So, you know, one of our overall reasons for keeping the general um, emphasis, for lack of a better word, on urban centers within the TIP criteria are these 
sort of excerpts of three um, policies that appear in MetroVision that, that hopefully are within the, within the larger excerpt that you had in front of you. Um, you know, MetroVision states that Dr. Cog will provide investment toward programs, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, to help local governments and the private sector develop urban centers, which really to me sort of fits in with what we're ultimately trying to do with the TIP. Um, we had a conversation earlier about sort of the transit piece and that, you know, there's only so much we as local communities can do to control transit. MetroVision clearly states that MetroVision prioritizes urban centers around existing or proposed transit stations with or, or with high frequency bus service. So that's where that sort of emphasis and those points came from is that MetroVision again states that not only are urban centers important, but urban centers that have transit or even air quotes more important. Um, and then the other thing that I'll explain in a second, um, it very clearly states that conne connections within urban centers are, is important, but also connections from urban centers to the, to, to the larger region. And you'll sort of see where that comes in here in a second. So you saw the red line version. This is sort of a somewhat of a, a, a re um, uh, some emphasis on, on that. So we've talked about rural town center, so we won't we won't talk about that. Um, so going to that first box where you would have seen the red line, where for instance we added it used to say entirely within urban centers. We we are proposing um, or directly supports, um, which actually gets to a comment that Commissioner Hilbert brought up earlier, is that we recognize. Um, that it's the connections to that urban center and out of that urban center is just as important as what's going on within the center itself. So, you know, we understand that, that it's not just that geography, it's, it's the area around it, that area of influence as well. And I guess I should have pointed out, um, you know, really the, the, the recommendations that we have in front of you are, in my words, codifying the way we thought about this last time, but, but we didn't necessarily um, you know, we weren't uh, necessarily uh, explicit about that. Um, the other one is that combined service headway. So if you remember that sort of cascading down um, level of points, you get a certain amount of points if you have, it used to say 15 minute headways. Uh, we recognize there are corridors that have multiple bus routes on them that may each be 20 or 30 minutes, but within that corridor, because there's a duplication of service, it gets to a much smaller headway. For instance, you go out here on Lincoln, there may be multiple buses that you could catch that get you where you want to go within a certain distance. And so, and we did that when we looked at projects last time, but we just wanted to sort of codify that so that people understand you don't need one route with 15 minute headways or less for that five, I think it's five points. You could have multiple routes that ultimately create a combined headway situation where you are under that 15 uh, minute threshold. So hopefully I'm not confusing folks. Um, so on that supportive activities um, box, sure, we can get that one first, okay. Do you want me to go back to the actual red line version, is that helpful now? Okay. So question, if you're not on fast tracks and don't have RTD service, but you would implement some sort of um, regional transit or park and wide or what, would any of that apply under this? Or is this just strictly you have to be on um, RTD one way or the other? It has to be a bus ride. Well, the first screen is, are you an urban center, right, and or in an area that ultimately is supporting the development of, of an urban center. So that's sort of, that's the more important first screen, or and now rural town centers as well. Right. So if you're a rural town center, though, you might not, it, well, you're not going to be on. Current, <laughs> currently, way that this is written with the addition that this group made earlier, rural town centers, you basically max out at two points under this category. Right, and so the uh, and, and we shouldn't be at six points or any of that. I, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying if you uh, to Eva's earlier point, well, there's nothing you can do because you already have you already have the suburban areas, and they don't have the transit. I'm I think there may be some things you can do. You may be able to do some sort of regional transit system. You may be able to set up some park and rides and stuff. But right now, there's no extra credit for that. Because only the only thing this refers to 
is RTD, right? Yeah, and again, we'll bet for a rural town center, it wouldn't. Yeah. I think, Chris, Chris, did you have a comment or no? You changed, you changed. All right, so I think I saw Jack and then Eva and then Elise. So can you walk through us just this scenario? So I'm, I'm going to brief a live one. So we, we have people out in Franktown who used to have a bus every morning that ran about every 20 minutes. And then... Um, CDOT, in their wisdom, took it out, said, no, we, we, need, we need more ridership. Uh, we needed a standing room only bus. And so then what, being facetious, sorry, but anyhow, so then it, eventually it got down to where they just took out the whole bus system. Now what's ironic at this point in time is all those people are now not riding a bus out of our control, and we can't get projects scoring high enough out there in that area to alleviate the problems that are caused now based on BMT and holding time, but I also can't get a bus route out there. So how, how do we address that? So we come in for a project here, you're saying you would get nothing here, or what's the story there? How would that work? Or does it, because it supports an urban center and it feeds Parker, which has an urban center, then does it apply then? I mean, obviously something that we would probably, and I think something that Jennifer brought up previously, you know, we would need some real guidance from this group, what you think directly supports means. Um, you know, we, we, we wanted to carry forward a notion that um, it's, it's beyond just the center. But, you know, that's a conversation that we'd have to have to kind of get to where, where do we, what's the threshold where we draw the line that's in terms of what support. That's the term directly supports that now incorporates the greater region that was my hope because everything spokes into the regional center. And if you're telling me that that now I can get points that I've got an urban center that it meets these criteria, but then I've got an entity that a, a roadway or something um, that now feeds into that, that I can now at least score some points to help that roadway because I can eventually then resolve that problem. But right, right now I've got to do it all on my nickel. So, okay, that's not bad, thank you. Okay, Eva. The only thing that concerns me in, in regards to this is once again, we're at the mercy of RTD. You know, and, and our government center, our bus service at the government center where my office is, is every two hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah every two hours we have a bus. And it, it's, it handicaps, so once again, it handicaps the suburban areas and the rural areas. And the, I think six points, maybe we should lower the points and put it somewhere else where everybody has a fair chance, you know, a better chance to get it. So maybe it shouldn't be as high as six points. And maybe we should take that six points and put it down into another area. Elise. I guess I would like to make a motion to support the staff recommendation to just move things along. I think we're going back to recognizing in terms of getting the biggest re regional bang for our buck, we're, we're prioritizing urban centers and places where we're going to be able to move the most people. Um, and so this makes sense to me. I hear your pain about RTD. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not, you know, the Northwest Corridor has got a lot of feelings about that. But I would say there are places, um, not to bring up the city of Boulder, but where they, <laughs> but I am because it, it's, it, it's an example of how to deal with when RTD is not giving you the frequency of bus service you want. You pony up local dollars and you buy more bus service, and that's how. You know, we've addressed that somewhat in, in the Boulder County area. It's not an ideal solution to all of our RTD woes, but basically there, there are options for getting, bringing transit into your community. So, Kathy. I think for those of us that have already experienced that when the rapid transit goes in, the bus service goes away. And for those of you that haven't had that experience yet, it's coming because it happened to the West Line. So all these areas that would have qualified before that are not sitting right on a light rail station, you're going to lose points. And that's kind of our purpose is that the bus service goes away because RTD is more about light rail than true mass transportation right now. And so when, you, when they need to make the budget work, they take away the bus service because partly because when you do the bus service, you have to provide the accessoride, which is very expensive. So I think it's a $60 
subsidy. And so that's what's happening in our suburban areas is they are cutting all the buses that are leading to our light rail stations because there's not enough ridership to overcome having to produce, having to provide the excessive ride. So therefore, we can't do what Jack just said. We can't get any money to help support even, and, and this is all about just urban centers, but you know, this is, you are in a catch-22, and just heaven help when the whole light rail system gets up, what's going to happen with the bus services? I think you're going to see a real change. We, oh. we have in the South. I, I, I just, you know, I think we all have our RTD horror stories, and I think we could spend the rest of the meeting just discussing that. Frankly, we've got a motion on the table. We've got a second. Um, all I'm asking it just is went, for us you, to you lower give me the one, points. Just give me one second, because I'm actually, what I was going to say was going to address what, I, what, you're, tr what you're trying to uh, say. I think, I, I actually think we would benefit from having a long, more productive discussion about points and urban centers. Um, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I think the idea of including the staff uh, recommendations but not putting points associated with them and then actually having another discussion. I know we don't need to meet forever on this, but I do think it would be worthwhile to come with better prepared to have this discussion. So I'm just going to throw that out there as an option. And then Eva, I was going to call on you. So if you want to make your comment. Yeah, I, I just, that's it. I mean, lower the points uh, is what it is. And as far as, you know, other, you know, ponying up more money for, you know, our own transportation, right now Adams County is dealing with 14% of poverty. So I don't think my citizens have the money to pony up for additional money in regards to mass transit. But all I'm asking for is to lower those points instead of having them so high to, to bring it down. Sue. Um, so in key, I, I'm actually in support of this motion and these points because in keeping with the principle of what is going to give us the biggest bang for the buck in reaching our goals, I think this is a big bang for the buck. What I would, though, th uh, suggest that we consider is potentially awarding points to projects that go above and beyond. They're not urban centers necessarily, but they find a way to provide some transportation and, and to do some things that will help achieve the goals. So for example, you might be a designated rural town center or a suburban area and you, this development is going to short stop traffic and therefore is going to help us achieve goals or this development is going to have a park and ride and therefore cut down on the pollution and the BMTs. Uh, I'm going to go to Rocky and then Jack. Yeah, this may be something that isn't a friendly amendment tonight, but may be uh, following up. So again, I, I think Eva and, and Kathy both have a very legitimate point. I mean, if we're awarding points that really are directly tied to RTD providing service, I think we have to address scenarios where RTD ought to be providing service and, and isn't. And I don't want to get into the horror story thing, but I'm, I'm thinking there may be a simple fix. Again, if we have the Adams County government center or centennial that uh, central place that that doesn't have the transit service that it ought to be having you know there ought to be some way we ought to recognize what investments what commitments that jurisdiction is making to create a transit supportive environment and somehow rather than reducing points find a way that they get points for that in lieu of, of not having RTD service so um, you know, uh, I don't know if that's just me throwing that out as a good idea and it's lame or if that's something we really want maybe staff to investigate a little bit and bring back to us. Yeah. J okay. Jack. I don't think we need to force a vote on this tonight. I think we can ask staff to come back with something that incorporates the conversation we're having. Why we think we have to force ourselves to a vote on this issue right now and then have to vote on it again later, I think the best thing for us to do is to vote it down, direct staff to come back with some point changes, some recommendations that incorporate um, the conversation that we've been having, which is a very productive conversation uh, regarding rural town centers, headway issues, and all these lowered point values so that we can address it. So look, uh, my recommendation is that, because I will not support it. I think we just vote it down and part of that then would be to recommend the staff please bring it back to us at the next meeting with some recommendations that incorporate those items. So. Okay, with that let's 
let's we've got a motion and a second and the motion is to pass the staff recommendation as is in our red line document at least yes go ahead the I th think we can accomplish both things without giving staff to, to some direction to go back and look at points. The proposed amendments don't speak to the points at all, really. It's about the verbiage around combined service. We already did the rural town centers. Um, so I think we could support the staff changes in the red line and still direct staff to go back and look at if, if this is the exact points. So, that's an, uh, so let's just call that an amended motion. Did you make the motion, Elise? I, I did. You did. Okay, but so I you just keep, I'm okay. voting for making the edits that I motion is to make the edits that the staff are proposed, and they're not making any proposals specifically on the numbers. On the points. Okay. All right. So th and w that has been seconded. By Chris. Yes. Okay. So the vote is the, what we are voting on is to make the edits recommended by staff not address the points but we will be coming but we we can bring that back up at an at, at another meeting to discuss the points because you're right at least the points have not been changed on this so okay all those in favor aye it does not have the points associated with it okay all right opposed okay move forward on that all right so are we ready to move on to the next one excuse me yes get voted yes. again all those in favor of what? I didn't hear the vote. Uh, it passed. We're going to accept it with with the text. What is that what you're asking? No, I, did, I didn't hear the vote. That's why I, I oh. just heard the ayes. Oh, I'm sorry. Were there nays? <laughs> nays? Aye. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, Jack. You could have just told me you wanted to vote no. Um, anybody abstaining on that one? <laughs> okay. All right. I know. He, I think he said aye, too. Um, other supportive, all right, so let's move on to the next one, other supportive <coughs> urban center implementation activities. So, Would you like me to walk you through these real well, quick? Well, I, I, th we did start there, we went back up, and now we're back down to this one again. So we just took a second well, the first vote was on the, just adding the word rural town centers. That second vote was making all of those edits in that box, and now we're moving on to um, the other supportive herb. I, I, I know, we went backwards. We're not going to do that again. Go ahead. Uh, so just this box sort of gets back. I mean, I think the easiest analogy is sort of the mile high compact analogy that folks had earlier. Um, this is about not only do you have an urban center, but are you are you ultimately following through with the tenants uh, for urban centers as outlined in MetroVision? And so staff is largely suggesting to keep this. And I mean, our, our, I think our thought process is to, is to make them as as simple as possible. Um, the first one is pretty simple. Um, do you actually have zoning or development plans that allow for mixed use? Um, as I mentioned, urban centers at their heart are basically mixed use, multimodal, and a variety of housing options. And so we just largely decided to keep it. Um, it sort of dropped kind of the gross densities piece because, as I mentioned previously, under our designation process for urban centers right now, there actually is no minimum density. So we just wanted to be consistent with previously adopted board policy that came subsequent to um, TIP policy. Um, I will also mention that this was another issue that we talked with local staff um, back in 2010, and they thought this was the most important sort of follow-on thing that we wanted to make sure that folks were doing was just to have a very basic um, regulatory environment that allowed for um, mixed use. Um, I'll just keep going through all of them if that's all right with everybody. I'm uh, just gonna, I, I, Brad, I'm going to stop you. Just, okay. okay. Does anybody have an issue with this? Eva. Don't hate me, guys, really. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to point out um, one of them is, uh, and this might be the wrong time to ask, but I'm going to ask anyway. For an urban center where the community has committed to preserve a development mixed income housing that see, says C definition below, uh, part of that definition is encouraging affordable housing in these urban centers. And since we've already, you know, we've, we've, we're doing really well in getting our housing in those urban centers, I want to know, one, how much of the, that housing we already have is affordable housing? So, Eva, I, that, I, w I was actually stopping after that first one point, so I think, can we, okay. do you mind holding that? Till uh, we get to the third, I just want to trying to rush it along. I don't. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to move to three if nobody has comments on one and two. And I, I don't sound, quite understand. 
Uh, you you, don't you want me to take another shot at it? I, I think where I'm at is understanding why that's any different than it's the project location is related to urban centers. Okay, it's entirely within our supports. And now we're going to give it one point because it, there is zoning somewhere else in the city that allows mixed uses or no, within, well, that with, spot, within, within the this, urban center. Within the urban center that they're applying for. Correct. I'm just trying to figure out how that's any different than the one above. So, okay. It either is or isn't. Well, the, the one above, Kath, I would think has to do with the transit transportation, and this one has to do with the, you know, the mix of housing and commercial retail, right? The one above is straight transportation. This is the zoning for that. For the Again, I'll try the mile-high compact analogy. Don't. The, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I mean, do, do you want me to? I can. Um, so when we talked earlier, the Mile High Compact, it was a yes or no, have you signed it, right? So in many ways, the first box that we've already talked about is that, yes or no. Are you an urban center, yes or no? Do you have some level of transit within that urban center, yes or no, right? That's, that's what that box is. This box is where we... The, where the conversation evolved is it's not whether you are you have signed the mile high compact it's are you following through with the tenants of the mile high compact this ultimately is doing that for urban centers it's asking in box one are you an urban center and if so what are your where are you located do you have transit those sorts of things box two that we're now talking about is okay you're an urban center but do you are you an urban center that has actually adopted mixed use zoning are you approving mixed use development since ultimately that is really sort of at the heart of um, what an urban center is described um, in MetroVision. Does that help? Okay. Should it not say other supportive urban center and then rural town? I mean, I guess, are the rural town centers getting that? Um, currently, this is basically geared towards urban centers only, but if you would like right. to have it for, for... Well, I'm just saying, I mean, I, I don't see how you do one and then you don't count and give them any points in in this section so okay so this should say rural town center and urban center then right if they have cuz they're not going to have rep chance I'm, I'm just saying if we're going to add ur town centers up i mean rural town centers up in the first one i don't see why it's not at the second one so I apologize that i've lost track of whether sue was before chris or chris was before sue so who wants to go? Sue. <laughs> so I do think there's some merit to these differentiations because we've already said that we have a huge variety in places that have been designated as urban centers and we've got a bunch that probably wouldn't even make it today. Um, but having said that, and I'm fine with all the wording, the points though, I know urban centers are really important and maybe we want to skew this program so that urban centers will absolutely, under every circumstance, score the highest on the whole thing. But they got ten po a ten point advantage on anything else right off the top. And so, and I'm not suggesting that a project should ever come to Bennett because I don't think that's ever going to be a good regional project. I'm just saying, our urban should they be that like that much higher than everything else if we go back to our goals. I hate to keep harping on that, but it just seems to me like this is a process that says, okay, 40% of our communities have urban centers and they are going to be the, the other 60% are going to be down somewhere because they'll never be able to get these 10 points or even close to it. Okay, I'm going to go Chris and then I'm going to go Elise. So the, the first box gives you s points for <laughs> urban centers with various transit characteristics or um, a rapid transit station or a designated rural town center. So why wouldn't these other points be for an urban center or a rapid transit station or a rural town center? In other words, if you have a rural town center where you've implemented zoning and development plans that allow for a mix of uses that seems like something you'd get a point for and there you know we're building some transit stations right now kind of in the middle of nowhere that aren't necessarily um, 
urban centers, but right around the transit station, if the transit station has zoning around it that is allows for a mix of uses, seems like you ought to get a point for that. I mean, would would that address Sue's issue there? If because I, I get your point that this second box provides a point for an urban center that does this and a point for an urban center that does that and a point for an urban center that does the other thing but all the other categories are left out if we're trying to encourage the right thing I, I think I think um, Jennifer has a comment here well that first box is valuing urban centers and and, 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 and right and now town centers, right? Um, or at least that's a recommendation to the board. The second box is about the added value that's happening within the urban center. And that's the question before you. Do you want that added value? We don't have to talk about points tonight. In fact, you haven't even said um, that the, the 2674 split uh, for Metro Vision and everything else is the correct um, value for for Metro Vision related points. So, points aside, do you value these other things, and do you want to leave them in there? And are you um, are you okay with the staff recommended changes to the text? Because this is just to further define and refine it. I think uh, Jackie said it right. It's, the, it's how robust the urban center is and how much you, uh, or and do you value those extra um, things? And I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just interject here. I do think we are getting extra points for being an urban center. And it, it's kind of the bang for your buck concept. And, it, and I think everything we're concerned, there's concern rural town centers. In my mind, they wouldn't apply because they're not going to have an adopted urban center or stationary master plan. That's one of the other things that's in this criteria. So, so and it's getting to be 9 o'clock. So, Part of me is thinking we need to have a more in-depth discussion on urban centers, you guys. I think there's a lot of questions and the, and the concept of rural, rural town centers and how we are going to award points. Um, I'd like to take the last few comments, though, but I, I don't think we're going to wrap this up tonight since we just lost air. So uh, I, I think it was Elise, Kathy, and then was there's I think they turned the air off on purpose to get us out of here. Elise, uh, Elise so, Kathy, oh. and then I saw somebody on this side, too, didn't I? No? Okay. Go. Um, so just real quickly, I think you've heard a lot of um, support for making sure that rural town centers aren't left out. My question is whether or not we're, we need to um, try to get points for that in this section, or are we really going to have rural town centers be addressed in sort of the pool concept later so that we can continue with sort of the biggest bang for the buck urban center concept without leaving the rural towns behind. So that's just one question. So as long as they're captured somewhere in the funding scheme, it may not be here, and I don't know. And then the only other question I had is, I understand that we had a legacy issue with requiring some level of density at urban centers. I get leery about completely jettisoning any concept of increased density in an urban center, and I need some uh, explanation from staff on why I shouldn't be concerned about that. Is mixed use really zoning a surrogate for that? Because otherwise, I wonder if there should be something in there more simple than what we had, but something about density in the urban center. I, I don't consider it a one-to-one -one surrogate. I mean, I consider them related to each other. Um, oftentimes, if you are going to do mixed use, you are also going to be having a denser product. That just tends to be the way that that product is, is developed. Um, you know, we basically took a cue from the from the board, who adopted the growth and development supplement that sort of wiped out um, the sort of the density thresholds that were associated with designation. So again, you know, my job is to sort of reflect that existing policy in some way. And so that's when this recommendation comes to you. I'm doing my best to make sure that something that is not that was four years old sort of 
um, reflects the, the most recent thinking. So obviously it's your decision or conversation as to whether that's something you would want to add back in as part of um, the TIP conversation. Kathy. My, my question, and just because I really haven't lived this as much as the rest of you, but the one point if the proposed project is identified in an adopted urban center or station area master plan, would that plan not include items one and two in this box where it's been zoned for mixed use and it would have a, um, the parking? I mean, isn't that the definition of urban center is that it meets those first two? So why would you get, to me, there's a double dip. My point. You, if you've got an adopted urban center plan, so that, so I know we're getting back to the points, but I guess I'm saying it would be you get a point for that or you get a point for the others. Maybe you don't have the whole adopted plan, but you've got number one or number two. But to me, if you have the last one on that list, you probably at least have one and two. I can see where you may not have the mixed income according to the definition. I can absolutely see that, especially for per certain parts of our area. So that I, I don't understand those definitions enough, but that seems, seems double-dipping there. Sue and then Jack. Um, I absolutely think that urban centers should get, have the opportunity to get more points because I think they give us more bang for the buck in, in our ultimate goals. I think they do that in, in the box above and I'm not so concerned about rural town centers as I am I guess suburban areas, lots of the, of the mid-sized towns in the region that don't have urban centers and for many reasons the Brighton doesn't have bus service, that kind of thing. I think any project that meets the second box criteria, uh, not just urban centers, ought to have an opportunity to get some points. Because um, if, they, if they have implemented zoning or development plans, even if they're small, it's going to have some impact. Um, if they have adopted parking management strategies, I mean, I don't think that should be, urban centers should get credit for it too, but I don't understand why any project wouldn't get credit for it. So I, see, I think the top box is fine. Uh, urban centers should get extra points, absolutely. But I, I think that we should have opportunities for other projects to get points if they're, if they're implementing all these strategies and actually should have some positive impact towards us reaching our goals. Jack. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm a bit, part of our goal, again, let's keep this in mind, was to simplify this process. I really think we're not shrinking the ring and removing marbles. We're just rearranging the marbles in the ring. So <laughs> those of you who play marbles, and, and so the fact is a kid in grade school, that's, that's what this feels like. i got to be honest with you. I don't see anything going away. We're just rearranging the marbles in the ring. Uh, frankly, when you look at those four points, I mean, those are land use issues. You're getting right down into the gist of it. Okay, the next thing is, okay, and you've got to have X number of houses and X number of buildings. What's next? I mean, I mean, this is going to a point where I think we don't need to be. If we're going to do anything, I totally agree. We should be taking our total point structure and even our dollars, and I think we should split our dollars up and reallocate an X amount to some rural component or and some to a more larger dense component. Then you get to the gist of it, and this is here where I think staff should be looking at this saying, okay, so what would it look like if you have a rural center that makes you then meet our goals in MetroVision as a whole? And what do you do in an urban center? But breaking out an urban center to this component level, I think we're just chasing, I mean, we're just chasing ourselves. Quite frankly, you're getting all the points you're going to get up front at the top anyway. Give all four points to a rural center concept. Develop the concepts. Do something else. But now we're just like, well, i got to make up four points somehow, so let's just divide this up some way, so I'm going to force myself to do it. And I just think that it, it has no structural benefit of achieving any goals whatsoever by breaking it up in this fashion. We're way down into land use mix arrangement at this point. Because I'll tell you something else. Even in a mixed use environment, the lawyer who owns the office downstairs doesn't live in the house above it. He's leaving town. Person who comes in to live in the house that's above him is coming in on that rail system, so they're coming and crossing somewhere here. So let's get real about that aspect too. But the fact is, is that it does have a, the density portion does have a benefit to it. So leave yeah. it to you, Jack, to just throw one more thing into it. So I think what I heard you just say was um, it was actually designate a do away with the whole thing. Yeah, a specific amount of money to go to 
urban centers a specific amount of money potentially to go to, to that's the rural That's a whole other concept, right? And I, I know. Split thing. I, I know. Well, that's kind of what I thought I heard you say, but that's it. That is completely. I mean, I think that is completely. A different conversation. Right. It really is. <laughs> so for you know, I think we do need to wrap up this evening. Um, one, one item as a request yes, uh, yes. for information from staff going forward. Um, it kind of gets to Jack and the marbles, uh, but also trying to think about this um, tactically and strategically at the same time um, is as we go through and we look at pools of money that become available to us, um, if you follow some of the logic behind MAP 21 is the better you do with regard MAP 21, uh, you at least run the potential of uh, at least a l continuing your allocation, possibly even increasing it uh, over time. Uh, at least that's been what uh, the current administration has uh, seemed to have in some of this, and it's kind of like the rich get richer. Uh, I'd like to hear from the staff um, strategic or tactical considerations about uh, addressing what are not yet uh, all the uh, elements within MAP 21 and how much that could possibly enter into our thinking as we start to take a look at points and projects and looking at uh, having a bigger pie for the region. And I think MAP 21 obviously is, is crucial to all of us. I, I am a little concerned about throwing MAP 21 concepts in on top of the tip right now, Phil. I don't know what the rest of the board is thinking about that. I. I I think it's important we cannot keep our heads in the sand on that issue. It's something we need to address. But um, I'm wondering if it's going to overcomplicate this to then now try and incorporate MAP 21 into it. And does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Rocky. Just real quickly, again, I, I think part of the point is that there's an aspect of MAP 21 that's dedicated to performance. So again, that goes back to some of what we saw earlier. I mean, are, are the investments we're making through this process helping us advance uh, regionally adopted goals and objectives. So I, I think we're there. I think, you know, we're, we're in the arena. Is there more we can do to maybe be a little more savvy uh, about that? Sure. But uh, uh, I, I think we're, we're playing in the MAP 21 game. Okay, I think actually, you guys, we, I, I, we're all, I'm feeling a little discouraged, but if we look at what we did accomplish tonight, we did accomplish a lot. We actually had a very thorough discussion on this Appendix F and the and the project location related to MetroVision implementation, and we actually even got in to a little bit of um, Appendix G. So uh, we do have some work to do on urban centers, and I think you've given staff um, a lot to think about. And, and um, you know, I think at our next meeting it will be a, a, a more. Th I think we've all been educated this evening as well, which will help with the next discussion on this concept of urban center town center. I think Jack brought an interesting idea. Maybe we take town center, ta rural town center out of the first box and dedicate the whole second box to points awarded for that. But then how do we incorporate the suburban issues? So that I, I think is what I'm hearing that we need to focus on. Is there anything else that y you guys think we need to be asking staff to focus on uh, before going, our next meeting? Going back to what I had said earlier was um, on the third point. On the, where it says C definition below, is I think I would really like to see a higher point for those who are able to do affordable housing in the urban center. Okay. Because it's hard to get developers to actually do, as we all know, affordable housing because they can't afford it. It costs more. So a higher points for affordable housing would be or, or great. somehow incorporating or somehow figure out how we we can make that points. work because it is part of of this conversation okay yeah. okay and jack just, just a closing comment in 2010 when we did this we had i think there were only three board members at the table at that time the rest were all outside agencies planning departments and everything else i can't tell you how beneficial this is going to be to have all board members because first off we get it Second off, we're going to be able to understand it when we get our TIP allocations. We're going to be able to explain it to the rest of the region. And we're thinking regionally. This is just going to be, I think, for the going forward benefit of, of the organization as a whole it, and the region is going to be immensely beneficial. So this is really good. I love the dialogue we're having. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the cause this evening? Yes. Jennifer. 
Pat. Oh, that's right. Now we're even going to be more depressed, everyone. <laughs> Don't be depressed. Uh, my last day at Dr. Cog is February 14th. My husband's been retired for a couple of years, and it's time for us to get in sync and do some big trips. Uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful time. Jennifer is the best boss in the whole world. She's given me uh, so many wonderful challenges, a uh, very tough decision for me to make. Uh, you all need to keep up the good work. It's very hard work what you do. It's hard work what you do in your individual jurisdictions, and it's hard work when you come here at the table, and you do it for no extra money. So, and, and very little recognition, and that's just uh, not just, well, that more recognition is so deserved. It has been an absolute pleasure working with you, and I will miss you all. I know, here we go. Oh, no. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. I know. That's why I think I purposely forgot that announcement. All right. I think we're adjourned. We'll see you guys in a month. Hey, I'll see you guys in three weeks. But, but can we get the board officers up here really quickly? <laughs> really quickly, because Connie's shutting us out. I know. I don't blame you. I'd shut us out, too. Jack, that's you. Jack, come here just really quick. Quickly, yeah, you, the office, board officers, really quick, short, short, I need to go home. If you need parking validation, let me know. Yeah, don't put your parking validation near anything magnetic, <laughs> like Don's head.
I was giving you a hard time. I'm sorry. No, you don't know me well enough to know. We will set ourselves on the farm.